Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report. With Sam Cedar. <laughs> Ever get the feeling you've been cheated? It is Wednesday, December 11th, 2019. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five time award winning majority report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America. Downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Lori Wallach, Director of Public Citizens Global Trade Watch on the U.S. Mexico Canada Agreement. Also on the program today, the Department of Justice Inspector General testifies no political bias in the FBI's launching of an investigation into the Trump campaign. However, there were subsequent FISA applications against Carter Page, in which people lied, more or less, in those applications. Meanwhile, Bill Barr still harping on a deep state conspiracy. That ship drifted a little further from the shore today. Donald Trump targets protests against Israel with an executive order redefining anti-Semitism and using a definition written by a guy who specifically says it should not be used in this way. Meanwhile, Pete Buttigieg dodging his role in some major Blue Cross layoffs. Joe Biden is now privately admitting he thinks he can only last one term as president. Trump pays $2 million for misusing, misusing charity funds. I just use them differently than for charity. It starts at home, folks. Federal judge blocks Trump's uh, misappropriation of funds for his border wall. And lastly, internal emails reveal that the water contractor in Flint, Michigan, Michigan, knew about the Flint lead poisoning months before the city confirmed it. All this and more on today's program. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome uh, to the show. A lot going on. We've been following the Inspector General uh, test of, uh, Department of Justice Inspector General testimony um, uh, today in the uh, Senate. And... Um, the gist of it, and we'll play some clips from it. It's important because, you know, we want to we want to ruin QAnon's day, I guess. Uh, but the gist of it, and is that after this thorough investigation, the inspector general found that the launching of the investigation into the Trump organization or the Trump uh, campaign was completely justified. That during the course of the campaign, the one person that they were surveilling, this was uh, Carter Page, and they had been surveilling him apparently off and on since 2013. In the third or fourth uh, renewal of the FISA applications, a, uh, a FBI lawyer essentially doctored some piece of evidence. It wasn't necessarily the... Um, the make or break in terms of continuing to surveil Carter Page. But it was highly inappropriate, probably illegal, it seems to me. But I don't know if they're pressing charges against this guy. I think they have referred it to an investigation. Um, But that was on Carter Page, who was apparently in the course of this investigation, this counterintelligence investigation against Trump, sort of a, a sidebar. The real story was, of course, that uh, George Papadopoulos had basically told a 
as far as we know, an Australian diplomat, we're anticipating getting stuff from Russia that's going to help the campaign. Um, but we will play clips from that. The relevance of this is limited. Uh, I hope that it leads to some type of FISA reform. I think that we have apparently some in the wake of Edward Snowden, but uh, clearly there's some uh, some gaps in this process. There does not seem to be anybody who really investigates the applications to FISA. They're just basically rubber stamped. Now, this is something that, you know, we've known since um, the, the late aughts, as it were. At least, you know, that uh, I've been talking about it and was aware of it at that time. Um, hopefully we'll get some reform out of this. Highly doubtful. But uh, as far as Lisa Page and Peter Strzok, they may have to be replaced in the, uh, in the narrative, although uh, Bill Barr is still out there trying to figure it out. In the meantime, uh, we're going to talk to uh, Lori Wallach today on this uh, USMCA uh, it's an interesting sort of debate where it really is all sort of speculative. I was on uh, Chris Hayes' program last night arguing with Barbara Boxer about whether this was a, a good thing to do. We will hear at least what happened as far as the agreement. You can make a determination as to whether it is worth it. And I think uh, we end the conversation with Lori Wallach. I pre-taped this earlier uh, with the, you know, well, well, I guess we'll know, you know, sometime late in November of 2020. But as I was going into the makeup room to take the makeup off my face, and when I told Saul I did that, he was pretty shocked that I put makeup on uh, at the, he didn't realize he had watched the show last night, I guess he wouldn't go to bed. And um, I came in and uh, I have to go through a door. They don't give me a full pass because I am such a barely employee there that I get a knock on the, the one of the locked doors. And there was a bunch of like, you know, guys with no necks, older guys who look like security guys. You can see they all look the same with all due respect to those guys. And... Um, I'm like, I wonder what this is about. You see that occasionally because there's like a congressperson or a senator or something like that. And I go in, I grab uh, the, uh, I know where it is. I've been in this place a million times. I grab my uh, washcloth thing and I look over, sitting in the chair right next to me is Mayor Pete Buttigieg. And um, now here's the thing. My buddy from high school, Joe O'Brien, became mayor of Worcester, which is twice the size of the city that he was in. So you should have said that. I'm not that impressed that I'm standing next to a mayor. Yeah, I was going to say, I've met college town mayors too. Sam. Exactly. In fact, in fact, I um, was student government president at my small liberal arts college and got almost as many votes for that position as he did as mayor. So I wasn't that impressed. But I got to say that generally when I meet people, like there's two type of politicians I will speak to. Ones who I really like and ones who I think are uh, totally evil. He has not quite achieved that level yet because I, I, frankly, I don't know. He hasn't had the chance, the opportunity in my mind to really influence politics in that way. He's evil. Look at his McKinsey. Consulting. Yeah, you haven't tried alone. It's possible. You haven't tried to buy, buy a loaf of bread in Canada yet. Yeah, you right. think he's evil. Also, but, uh, you would debate one potentially on MSNBC, uh, like a Barbara Boxer. Oh well, I mean, and I'm I, I'm just putting it out there for the memeologists in the audience. Rob Reiner style romantic comedy vehicle between uh, Barbara Boxer and I. Well, yes, that could that, that could starts that could turn by into arguing yeah. about sort of like the um, new NAFTA right. on MSNBC. I think it writes itself. Uh, it's I, it, what was it? What was that uh, mod and what, what was I can't remember what that. There was a 
There was a Harry so, met Sally. No, there was a different one. Harold and Maude. Ha, and you're how suggesting that you're that much younger than she is. I don't know. It's getting pretty close. <laughs> Wow. Now we're really escalating for the next but, appearance. I like so it. So it's not totally Harold and Maude. I, I but, suggested but it was a Harold and Maude so scenario, I just, Senator Boxer. I figured the best thing for me to do is just, I just looked at him like this, and he's sitting in the chair, and he's like this, and I went, and I just, I didn't, I didn't even acknowledge him. I figure like a guy like that, the best thing to do is just, I don't recognize who this dude is. Big deal. We're probably um, in a spreadsheet that he has somewhere. It's, I, I would imagine. Um, I mean, you know, like there's been times in MSNBC where I've gotten into arguments with like uh, Pataki. Yeah, I don't know if you were around when he said to me like, you, you're not that stupid that you actually believe that. Stuff like that. And, Pataki. Yeah, exactly. But um, so here's uh, Pete Buttigieg after he uh, got out of the makeup chair. Um, and I think I heard him say, make me look older. And uh, <laughs> I'm joking. And he went on and there is uh, apparently... As you know, there there is footage of him talking about one of his consulting gigs where he found a lot of redundancy, had to lay off a bunch of people. And um, uh, Wendell Potter... Which is a very weird way of talking about burning down an Afghan village. Right. Well, no, Wendell Potter, uh, a, a former uh, insurance executive, had said at the time, like, I'm pretty sure what he's talking about is like, you know, a Blue Cross, Blue Shield. Yeah, he totally called it. Totally called it. And uh, so... Buttigieg, uh, who worked for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. Now, understand, the uh, the amount of uh, money that's involved uh, with uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan is, uh, is um, uh, the CEOs get a lot of money. Here he is being asked about it, and then uh, Rachel Maddow uh, responds. When, when you did that sort of cost and overhead assessment for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan, a, a couple of years after that, they laid off like a thousand people. Was your work part of what led to those layoffs? I doubt it. Uh, I don't know what happened in, in the time after I, I left. That was in 2007 uh, when they decided to shrink in 2009. Mm -hmm. um, now, what I do know is that there are some voices in the Democratic primary right now uh, who are calling policy that would uh, eliminate the job of every single American working at every single insurance company in the country. Uh, do we have more footage there? We, we don't. Do, what does she respond like? Oh, no, that's that's a total lie. So in other words, he, he dodges his um, his recommendations to cut and they and the idea that like I have no idea what happened as a consultant. What happens is I give the recommendations and then they do it the next day, I guess. Well, there, what's but, the uh, Bible verse for having humility about your contribution to mass layoffs when you're but, a consultant? But but I, I, I hope that the next thing that Rachel says here is, well, that's a complete lie. In fact, everyone knows that. All those people at Blue Cross Blue Shield, a significant percentage of them, probably a, a more even a majority of those people who are working, not the CEOs necessarily, uh, because they may not find it as lucrative, but they will be contracted in the same way that, um, and, and they or they will get they will either be contracted to do certain uh, things for Medicare for all. Or they will be hired because they are qualified to come in and do much of the same work. I just would like to add um, that word he uses of uh, when they decided to shrink. I think it was the word he used. Was that the word he used? They, maybe they shrunk. They, sh they did some shrinking after I was Shrinkage. there. Shrinkage. Shrinkage. That is such a tell because... It, people learn different euphemisms in different professions right. talking about firing people talking about laying off a right you don't people. say layoffs you don't say, say shrinkage. Yeah, you say a shrink right i mean you could this is all it's all uh george clooney up in the air stuff look at the euphemism i tried finding it but that's where maddow clips it on her uh, yes site, so. uh, well uh, i mean uh, the, the response with... for for rachel uh, hopefully was <laughs> pete uh, on or mayor pete uh honestly that's that's a little disingenuous. The idea that all those people are going to lose a job. And in fact, it's outlined in every person's plan who's come out with a Medicare for all plan uh, speaks to what will happen to hundreds of thousands of those people 
will go back in and either work for the government plan or end up being contracted out to do parts of the government plan. It's just absurd. Uh, meantime, folks, if you feel like you don't have time to read all the, uh, the books you want to, uh, welcome to the club. Welcome to Sam's I Don't Have Time to Read All of the Books I Want to Club. Blinkist is an app that compiles the key takeaways from thousands of nonfiction books. Everything you need to know is condensed down to 15 minutes. You can either read it or you can listen to it on the app. Blinkist is uh, super unique. It works on your phone. It works on your tablet or your web browser. You'll find everything from self-help titles to um, history titles to science to economics to communication skills oh wait a second i know uh you want to talk to um you want to talk to mckinsey pete go into the corporate culture section you can learn about scaling up excellence or how successful peating uh, people think or meetings suck too fast to think i mean there's a there's a whole mess of these books and and i've talked about like the sort of ooh, sex and relationships Oh, they have that Christopher Ryan book that you like so much, Sex at Dawn. You can mm -hmm. listen to it 15 minutes. Emotional Intelligence. That's a book I like. That's one maybe I will look into, mm -hmm. uh, all things I've considered. I've been recommending it to you for years. <laughs> I you never listen. Well, um, but with Blinkist, you get unlimited access to read or listen to a massive library of, of condensed nonfiction books. All the books you want for one low price. So you don't have to stop improving yourself. Right now, for a limited time, Blinkist has a special offer for our listeners. Go to Blinkist.com slash majority. Try it for free for seven days. And then when you realize, like, I got to get this, you save 25% off your new subscription. That's Blinkist, B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T dot com slash majority to start your seven-day free trial. And then get 25% off. Check it out, folks. Don't forget, like, my favorite, the four-hour work week, Tim Ferriss. That's the one. That's my aspiration. That's my aspiration for everybody. Well, yeah, not everybody. I don't have to aspire for some. Some of our... Oh, achievements. if only it were so. You know, the joke just doesn't work anymore. I don't know. I think people think it's funny. Matt left. Uh, folks! Well, he did. Your redundancy is charming. Part of the contract. <laughs> <laughs> um... Look, you already uh, eat clean, right? I would imagine most of the people who listen to this show are uh, now uh, eating, uh, trying to eat food that is healthy. Hopefully, if you're smart, you're using uh, uh, cleaning products at home that are not so toxic. Why would you put on makeup and skincare products that contain questionable ingredients? Beauty Counter is on a mission to get safer makeup and skincare products into everybody's hands. It started in 2013 when apparently they um, started to shed light, Beauty Counter did, on the need for stronger ingredient regulations. People don't realize there's none. There's none. As far as I know, there's virtually none. Today, it's the leading, it is the leading cleaning uh, beauty brand, creates innovative and high-performing products that are safer and cleaner than competitors. They got everything that you'd need. Moisturizers, makeup cleansers, sunscreen. Why are cleaner ingredients important? The U.S. hasn't passed a major federal law to regulate the ingredients used in personal care products since 1938. Over 1,500 questionable ingredients are never used in beauty counters formulations. That's their clean promise. Kelly has been using Beauty Counter, and she says, I love having simple skincare, makeup routine. I've tried a lot of different things. And uh, when shopping for cleansers, serums, creams, makeup, it's just easier to ignore the mind-boggling list of ingredients inside the packaging. Things like formaldehyde or coal tar. At one point, she realized that she didn't want any more benzocolonium chloride on her face. She says, Beauty Counter makes it easy to avoid these ridiculous ingredients while still providing luxury products. I've been using Lotus Glow Cleansing Balm as a combination makeup remover and cleanser, which is a time saver. I don't understand whatever that means, but it sounds good. Uh, she writes, the overnight resurfacing peel brightens my skin with zero irritation, which is something close to miraculous. 
Not only is Beauty Counter committed to advancing clean skincare, everything I've used has required a fraction of the amount of product I'm used to, which makes their entire line a bargain. I'm a total convert. Beauty Counter has truly become my one-stop shop for all my skincare products and make and makeup. She actually like won't stop talking about it to me. Every time we have one, she writes like, "I love this stuff." I'm like, okay, I get it. If you're new to Beauty Counter, now is the time to head to beautycounter.com. Check out special holiday offers before they're gone. That's beautycounter.com. You don't need a promo code. Just clean makeup, skincare, and gifts for everyone you love. All right, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, I'll be talking to Lori Wallach about the USMCA. We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It's a pleasure to welcome back to the program the director of Public Citizens Global Trade Watch, Lori Wallach. Lori, welcome back to the program. Thank you very much. So um, yesterday um, it was announced, and I think it, um, I don't know if we, we haven't had quite a, uh, it obviously has to go to the Senate, but, um, and, and I don't know that they actually had the vote yesterday in the House, but it appears at the very least they have the votes. Um, to pass the U.S. MCA, this is the United States Mexico Canada Agreement. It's NAFTA 2.0, I guess. Um, maybe some would argue 1.2 or something like that. Uh, but um, that's why I wanted to hear, Lori. Go through. Just tell us a little bit of the background of of what this supposed new NAFTA is. Um, there's a lot of questions around this not the least of which is, was it worth it doing this from a political standpoint? But let's first just look at the, at the, the trade agreement itself. So what happened yesterday was the Democrats announced that after a year of fighting to improve a really bad NAFTA renegotiation Trump signed in 2018, they had forced changes to the deal and the administration had agreed and Mexico and Canada had agreed. So there hasn't been a vote yet. The the backstory of this is that after 25 years, NAFTA had proved to be the disaster that a lot of congressional Democrats and unions and consumer and environmental groups had predicted in the first instance. Over a million U.S. jobs are government certified as lost to NAFTA. $400 million had been paid out in investor state corporate attacks on North American environmental and health laws in front of tribunals of three trade officials. And the, the damage was ongoing. Every week, companies were outsourcing jobs to Mexico to pay workers less. Wages in Mexico are now lower than when NAFTA started and 40% lower than Chinese manufacturing wages. So the NAFTA was a mess and an ongoing mess with new damage happening every week. So the mission was, could changes be made to ameliorate that damage? And the deal that Trump renegotiated and declared was wonderful and gave a new name. He called it the USMCA, as you said, did that at the end of last year. That agreement actually was worse than the original NAFTA in that Trump let pharma rig it and add new monopoly protections that would have locked in high medicine prices here, handcuffing Congress from changing the existing laws that have given us the highest medicine prices in the world, and then exporting those bad policies to raise prices in Mexico and Canada. So Democrats said, hey, your new NAFTA locks in high medicine prices and doesn't fix the original sin of NAFTA outsourcing. Forget about it. You've got to renegotiate. You renegotiate a deal or we're not interested. And then a year of fighting started. And, and yesterday, Trump agreed to a bunch of the Democrats' demands. Uh, let's talk about what those demands were. I mean, I know that at the very least, my understanding is that the, um, uh, the investor dispute settlement, um, ISDS, I, 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 you'll have to help me on this, but the, the mechanism in which essentially um, uh, disputes are settled, that, that element seems to have been taken out. Is that correct? So just, yes. So to give a little background for your listeners, folks who remember when you guys were talking about the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP, 
and helping people understand what that was. This is those corporate tribunals at the heart of TPP. They came out of NAFTA. That was the model. And this is where multinational corporations can demand unlimited compensation from taxpayers by going to tribunals of three corporate attorneys who can decide if the investors' special rights and privileges given in the agreement were undermined by a domestic environmental or had all their safety law. And under NAFTA, $400 million has been paid out by taxpayers to multinational corporations in successful attacks on energy regulations, water use policies, timber policies, tax expand. Outrageous. So the new NAFTA. And let me just add one more one more aspect of that. My understanding, too, that is also problematic is that it probably it's cost taxpayers in that because we've had to pay for profits that um, uh, corporations would have anticipated getting were it not for uh, laws that we made to protect the environment, to protect consumers, to protect workers or whatever it was. But also, I imagine we have instances where uh, municipalities where counties where states uh, or, or the country at large uh, didn't m- made decisions not to pass certain protections because of a fear of running afoul of that. Precisely right. And also in some instances, existing protections were eliminated to avoid the next case after the first payout happened. So for instance, Canada got rid of a ban and a, and a, toxic gasoline additive we ban here after the Ethel Corporation, the folks who put lead in our gasoline, won an ISDS NAFTA case um, and part of the settlement was reversing that ban. So you're spot on. It's okay. a very bad thing. So what happened, what, what, from my perspective, the single best thing in the new NAFTA is Investor state dispute settlement was altogether eliminated between the U.S. and Canada. That's a big deal because most of the environmental ISDS NAFTA attacks have been U.S. corporations attacking Canada. And, in fact, all of them but two have been that. And the, the elimination of ISDS between the U.S. and Canada also means 93%, almost all U.S., ISDS exposure is gone because of all the foreign investors in the U.S., only mainly the Canadian ones had ISDS rights. There are a handful of companies from other countries where we have free trade agreements that have ISDS, but mainly it was Canadian companies. So that is a huge improvement. Then with respect to Mexico... And we should also say... I'm sorry. We should also say that this... The, the benefit of this is that maybe it provides a precedent for future trade deals saying we didn't have it here, we don't need it there. Well, what I'm, what I'm about to say is then with respect to Mexico, so people will say, okay, between two developed countries with strong court systems, I guess maybe whatever. But this is the thing that is truly precedent setting. With respect to Mexico, a country that doesn't have a strong rule of law, the new agreement whacks the old ISDS system, and it only allows compensation through a reformed process where, for instance, the tribunalist can't be both serving as a lawyer suing a government and serving as a judge. You have to pick a side. Or where the damages aren't based on the speculative future expected profits, which, as you pointed out, is what the current system is, but rather you have to prove actual damages. But also, the only thing you can get compensation for is if the government actually expropriates your property, takes it physically. A definition is physical seizure or total control of title. And for direct acts of discrimination against a foreign investor after an investment's been set up. That is compared to the current NAFTA, which creates this broad right for a foreign company to invest, right to control natural resources, right to not be regulated. All that stuff got whacked. So for the world to see here in the belly of the beast, the country that had pushed ISDS, that expanded it. We are the country that expanded ISDS and the TPP to even more broader rights. Here we are getting rid of it altogether for developing countries. And with respect to a, sorry, with developed countries and with respect to a developing country partner, 
basically narrowing it down to compensation for direct expropriation in, in a much more fair system. Okay. That is a huge signal to the whole world that even here we see the ISDS system as illegitimate. And that's super helpful because a lot of developing countries started with South Africa, Brazil was out there already, but Ecuador, Bolivia, Indonesia, other countries have said, we're out of this system. This thing is ridiculous. And now the U.S. basically sending the signal lets a lot of other smaller developing countries join the bandwagon and try and exit this dangerous system. So that's the best thing in the New Deal. But even though the Democrats were able to get all that new bad pharma stuff out, and that's, you know, that's, that's definitely worth noting, because typically U.S. trade agreements just keep giving the pharmaceutical companies more and more protection, that was just taking out a new bad thing. You know, that's like classic Trump, right? He creates a crisis, and then he right. tries to get credit for fixing it. So that was like, you know, that was, that was a bag of crap he put into it, and then, you know, okay, I'll take my bag of crap back out. But that was just an additional problem to the original NAFTA. The real open standing question is, are the improved labor and environmental standards that, you know, the original ones that Trump signed in his deal in 2018 were a mess. The Democrats made improvements for sure. But are those improvements, is the improved enforcement right. going to actually prove to be enough to reverse some of the outrageous wage suppression in Mexico. Now, when Trump says this is going to bring back hundreds of thousands of jobs, that's 100% baloney, garbage, absurd. That's not happening. That's not what this deal is. This is not a transformational people and planet first, this is for the workers deal. The question is, can these improvements actually create real unions in Mexico so people can fight for real wages, and the result will be less draw to outsource jobs because folks in Mexico get paid more. That's the real story of what we have to watch to see if this deal does. Okay. So uh, we have the IMF saying that the most we can imagine is about 50,000 jobs tops created in the U.S. The question is, is do these reforms in terms of protections for, for labor in Mexico, do they have enough teeth uh, will they be enforced in such a way that over time it will gradually increase the protections of and the wages of Mexican workers, which will then stabilize, you know, that sort of giant sucking sound that Ross Perot had talked about, I guess, gosh, 30 years ago now. Um, all right. So with all that said, and, and my understanding, too, is that there were some um, uh, financial uh, sector giveaways as well, or at least uh, protections for um, for financial interests. Um, do, what, what can you tell us about that before we sort of step back and make a sort of broad assessment? Yeah. So what I can say generally is there's plenty of the bad stuff that was in the original NAFTA that didn't get fixed. And that includes all kinds of limits on regulation for food safety, for all kinds of services, energy, financial services. Um, there, is, there is one new bad thing for financial services, which is the right to transfer data freely, financial data, which um, there was an exception in the original NAFTA, so that's slightly worse. But frankly, it was already really bad. It's just slightly worse. And some of this bad stuff, was left intact, but it's already there. I mean, the, you know, the thing everyone needs to understand is the agreement on offer is not the template for a good progressive agreement. A good progressive agreement would have climate provisions, which this doesn't. It would have enforceable currency disciplines. It would have rules against monopoly. It would not have any constraints on the regulation of food safety or the environment or the big online giants or some service sector like energy or finance. That stuff is leftover garbage from NAFTA and it's, you know, still so, there. They didn't put in the things missing. They didn't take out some of the bad stuff. So, the, the, it, what we have here is a floor with no ISDS. You know, it's mainly whack. There's still some bits of it. It's a problem. But with ISDS mainly whack, without the crazy pharma stuff, with stronger labor and environmental standards and enforcement, Maybe not strong enough to make a difference. We'll have to see if it works. That's the floor from which we'll have to keep advocating for a stronger, better, real progressive agreement. But the mission is to try and stop some of NAFTA's ongoing damage. 
And so the political quandary, which I know is where you're going, right, is who makes that call? As much as we all despise Trump, if there is an offer, the prospect of actually making a lot of people in the U.S. and Mexico's lives better, then what is that line where not wanting to do it during the Trump era means we should deny the prospect of having an agreement that's better than the old one go into effect? Correct. And that is, from my take, when the ISDS whacking happened, is when I started saying to myself, all right, now I need to see if they get the pharma garbage out and if they make real progress in environment and labor and enforcement, because then we do have something that actually practically could make people's lives better and could make enough of a difference that it's worth contemplating the importance of trying to stop some of the ongoing damage. Because as much as we aspire to a future Democratic progressive president and a Democratic Congress doing a really progressive trade agreement, we don't know what the future will hold politically. We don't know what the future will hold policy-wise. And if we have it in front of us, the chance to try and stop some of NAFTA's damage in a real way, then for me, I mean, I, I largely leave the politics to other people. The policy sort of moral imperative is you can either have the old NAFTA or you can have something that might fix the damage. When you get to the standard of you have something that might fix some of that damage, slow it down. Then for me, the choice is you go for the fix, particularly with ISDS because you're signaling to the whole world. Right. Okay. that they have the power to join, to take the U.S. cover, to join the exit of this corporate power scheme. Okay. Uh, but, you know, people with smarter politi- political judgment... Well, no, I understand. No, that's, I mean, that's why I wanted you on. I wanted to get an assessment of just, like, you know, what, how how dramatic of an improvement would this be to warrant, uh, potentially, um, Donald Trump, being able to go through uh, the three states that he won by, you know, um, uh, less votes than than show up at a, uh, you know, at a really big rally or pretty close um, with a, a picture of uh, Richard Trumpka and saying to uh, these uh, to people in these states where you do have um, a much higher density of union workers, probably somewhere around 25 percent of households uh, saying, look, I came through for you guys. Um, And that, I mean, that's ultimately the question is, um, is something like this when you're talking about a marginal, uh, you know, such a thin razor thin, uh, you know, a chance of, of Donald Trump winning, or I should say winning by a razor thin margin. Is it, is it ultimately uh, worth this? What in terms of timing, um, did, was there any, is there anything, is there any type of clock ticking? Uh, a clock ticking on the agreement? No, a clock ticking on the renegotiated agreement. In other words, when, ah. when Donald Trump signed it a, a year ago as a way of saying like, okay, now we're going to go work it out. Was there, this expires in 12 months, this expires in 24 months. If we don't get it done within 36 months, what, I mean, was there any type of, is there any type of clock ticking? In other words, uh, could these negotiations have gone on for another five, ten months? I think that, um, no, there is no legal clock ticking is the answer. And <clears throat> I think that the, um, again, I leave the politics to other people. Right. But I think no. that from some of the people I have heard talk about this, who I think are very smart politically, a lot of people thought politically it was a smarter move to have a vote on a revised NAFTA in the lame duck session after the 2020 election so that Trump could not go around the country announcing he had achieved this. Now, on the other hand, I do want to say that he can run around saying he's renegotiated NAFTA, but the reality is we're losing manufacturing jobs. We're basically slipping into a recession in the manufacturing sector. So currently there is an increase in layoffs in the manufacturing sector such that you can say, you know, I've been a great success. He can claim that, you know, he's fixed things, 
But if people's actual experiences, they have been laid off from manufacturing jobs, if the Democratic candidates running around saying there are X hundred thousands of less manufacturing jobs, here's how much bigger the trade deficit is than it was at the start of the Trump administration. Here are all the things the president didn't deliver on trade. Right. I, I don't mean, know how to judge what the impact of this agreement is. Right. I mean, uh, we, we look. We have farmers who are being um, who have been who have taken it, uh, you know, gotten smashed in the face uh, by the Trump administration. Uh, there is no reason to believe that they're not supporting Trump as you know as much as they were. Um, my concern really is more the imagery. Uh, you know, we live in an era now where uh, you know if if we were going to rely simply on on economic news. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, apply a standard uh, formula to that, then Donald Trump will walk away with this election. And uh, so, you know, we're, we're, we're living in a different era now. And I guess, let me ask you this. Um, when it goes to the Senate, and, uh, and certainly there has been some pushback by some of the Republicans in the Senate, my understanding is that Mitch McConnell is now planning to bring it up after the impeachment trial, presuming the MP, the articles of impeachment go to the Senate at the beginning of the year. So this is going to show up on the calendar in, in the, the Senate. Could be February, could be March, could be April, somewhere around there. Senate could easily just say, oh, we're going to pass our version of it, which is going to have that ISDS in it, right? And then they send it back to the House. Am I, is that correct? It can't happen that way because the the way it works is the international agreement itself is signed between the three parties, and that's what determines whether there is, for instance, ISDS or the pharma giveaways. It's the actual agreement. What Congress votes on is what's called implementing legislation, and it basically the first article says the United States Congress approves and enters into the international agreement called blah, blah, signed on blah, blah date. And so Congress's authority is only to implement or not implement the actual agreement. The agreement sets the terms. So yesterday when the new, when the amendments to the agreement were signed, that's what's on offer. So, so the amendments of the agreement were, were, so the, who did the signing yesterday? The governments of the United States, Mexico, and Canada. Okay, so the so the agreement itself now has eliminated the ISDS. So there's no way for the Senate to amend what the House has done. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, it's not that the House has done it. The actual international agreement signed between the three sovereign nations has in its terms, for instance, you know, what used to be Chapter 11B of the NAFTA, that's Investor State Dispute Summit, no longer is in the tax. Okay. And instead, there is nothing between the U.S. and Canada, and there's a special annex with this new limited system with Mexico. And that is what, that was already in the 2018 tax. Yesterday, they then signed pages of amendments to the 2018 tax, so once, which got rid of the farm and giveaways, et cetera. So once those are signed, then the House turns around and says, okay, now we feel comfortable in essentially giving the the green light for uh, for uh, for for implementation of this. That's the way it works. Congress has constitutional authorities to implement the agreements. The executive branch negotiates and enters into them. So this but what this I mean So so in other words point, though, the Senate, when it goes to the Senate, sorry. it's an up or down vote. It's an up or down vote in the Senate. Exactly. Now the Senate could do the I mean there are all kinds of procedural anomalies that would be required, but you know, the Senate could um, the Senate could um, refuse to pick up the bill unless and until X Y Z happened. But then they'd have to go back and negotiate some more. Okay, so it, it's a so a Mitch McConnell has an up or down vote essentially for all intents and purposes, and it doesn't it doesn't go back to the House. I mean that uh, that that at least alleviates uh, a, a deep concern of mine, which is. <laughs> Uh, that once they've, you know, once the House has gotten sort of pregnant with this idea of like we we rolled them uh, and then it comes back to them in a, in a different form that they wouldn't capitulate. But at least that's off the table. All right. Well, you know, Lori, I appreciate this uh, assessment of it. And so, you know, people can make their deter- their own determinations as to whether uh, from a political standpoint, um, if, you know, if it if it's worth it. And um, it may be one of those things where, you know. Uh, I'll tell you on November, you know, whatever it is, 8th, uh, 2020. Oi. 
<laughs> exactly. Well, Lori Wallach, um, uh, Director of Public Citizens Global Trade Watch, really appreciate your time today. Thank you very much. I, I would like to have every interview I do end with the guest saying, oi. I think that's probably a, a, apropos for this era. Um, so uh, two clips I want to play before we go. The um, the first, or I should say the second, is uh, going to be um, one of the questions that Diane Feinstein asked of Michael Horowitz. Horowitz is the Inspector General on um, the Inspector General of uh, the Department of Justice, and uh, he was testifying in front of the Senate today um, as to the investigation that he did into the launching of the counterintelligence investigation against the Trump administration. Um, it looks like we're having all sorts of problems with that, uh, that video. <laughs> I'm trying to line up the second video and I'm trying to vamp in between. Um, the, uh, and that hearing, I think is just, maybe they just took a break and I, I don't know if it's going to wrap up for the day. But essentially, what's at stake here is the ability for the Republicans to maintain this deep state fiction that um, has been ongoing. I mean, I don't know. How long has QAnon been been putting this out there? Um, and really, Bill Barr has been uh, pushing quite a bit of it. So um, we will get to that fact should we play that first can you yeah we'll play this first so this is um michael horowitz and remember the the name of the investigation that first the, the counter tele intelligence investigation that was launched into the um uh, trump campaign was spurred by George Papadopoulos saying to a what we believe is an Australian um, former diplomat. In fact, I think he was even more more than uh, just a diplomat. I think he was actually like a, um, a fairly high-placed, uh, functionally equivalent of the State Department from Australia. I met in a bar and Papadopoulos says, you know, we, we're getting information from the Russians uh, that are going to help the campaign. And it's a, uh, and that's basically when this thing started. And uh, again, obviously, real deficiencies they talk about in the uh, FISA application for um, uh, who uh, I can't even remember his name now. What's that guy's name? The the crazy guy, the, Carter Page, but. That was not sort of the focus of this investigation. Carter Page was one element of it, and they have been uh, basically <clears throat> uh, surveilling Carter Page on and off since 2013. So here's Diane Feinstein asking uh, Michael Horowitz uh, the, the question of, this is specifically about the parallel investigation that's going on with Bill Barr and the... U.S. Attorney from Connecticut, uh, Durham. Durham wrote a letter after meeting with uh, Horowitz saying, I don't agree with all the conclusions. But Horowitz had, prior to that, met with Durham and Barr and said, give me any information that you have that you think would should change my conclusions in this investigation. Here's that question. Uh, FBI Director Ray provided a written response to your report, accepting all of your findings. And these include the key finding that there was, quote, an authorized purpose and actual factual predication for the investigation. By contrast, Attorney General Barr expressed his doubt about the legitimacy of the FBI's investigation in press statements. Did Attorney General Barr provide any evidence that caused you to alter this key finding that the FBI investigation had an adequate predicate? Uh, no, we stand by our finding. Thank you. 
During your investigation, Attorney General Barr stated his belief that, quote, spying on the Trump campaign did occur, end quote. And as you said, your investigation found no evidence that the FBI placed any confidential source within the Trump campaign or tasked any confidential source to report on the Trump This holiday season, correct, ask right, yourself, right. what do you want? No evidence that political bias or improper motivations influence the decision to use confidential sources as part of the investigation. That's correct. Did your office ask Attorney General Barr and U.S. Attorney, Gen uh, US Attorney John Durham <clears throat> to share whatever evidence they had that might be relevant to your investigation? Um, we asked uh, Mr. Durham to do that. And what about Attorney General Barr? A and Attorney General Barr. Thank you. So nothing they could provide altered your office's conclusion that the FBI did not place spies in the Trump campaign? No, none of the discussions changed our findings here. Thank you. Okay. In a press there, statement... There you go. So there was nothing that uh, Barr or Durham had as of uh, a week or two ago that countervails this, uh, their findings. So apparently Barr and Durham are withholding information from the inspector general or they're hoping to find other information that would justify their statements that they released saying that there's something wrong with this investigation. I mean, a Bill Barr is on basically, you know, uh, some type of uh, writer's retreat right now. Where he and Durham are, are held uh, uh, hold up in some type of, you know, I don't know, some cabin somewhere, just bouncing ideas off each other, trying to come up with a good story. So we shall see. All right, we don't have that other video. That's okay. Uh, that's okay. Don't worry about it. We don't need it. Um, all right, we're going to take a, a break. Oh, first, let me just read this, too, just because it's a, a, a correction. And we had somebody on hold yesterday for a long time. Um. Or, uh, I don't know, this is a comment that she wanted to make. She was on hold from, uh, a, uh, hi, Sam, I'm a union rep for the BECTU union at the BBC. Uh, the BBC is not state media in any way. It's a public broadcaster. The funding comes from a television license. That is, if you buy a television, you have to pay a yearly license fee, which goes directly to the BBC. The funding never touches the government. This is a similar setup to like the uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Uh, there is no appropriation from Congress. There is just a funding mechanism where they get fees from banks. Uh, I, that's my addition. Uh, she writes, uh, the one minor exception to that is the foreign office contributing to the foreign language services of the world uh, service broadcasts in other countries. Uh, and then he, she says... Uh, the BBC often ends up in fights with the government of the day, et cetera, et cetera. Our public charter mandates impartiality. We do take that very seriously. I started on the BBC news help desk and talking to journos every day, so they also take that seriously and most refuse to even vote because of it. Laura Quisenberg has been running all over the country covering the election and trusted source sent her and Peston, that's another, I guess, reporter, uh, the video. Well, Michael, tell us what the video is. It was a video that apparently um, the Tories were sort of spreading fake news about being attacked, uh, I think, at a hospital, some type of anti-labor video. And she shared it and it was uh, debunked and it was sort of like uh, it was the case of people saying that the BBC was sharing fake news. That's what she's referring to. And so uh, and she's saying that instead of, you know, it wasn't malicious, she was harried and, you know, over busy covering the election. She said, uh, yes, she goes on to say, Laura, apologize for the mistake. A couple of newspaper columnists said it was BBC publishing fake news when in reality it was a very busy woman. Should have checked more carefully. Maxim might try to live by his don't attribute to malice, what can generally be explained by ignorance. There is sometimes, um, in my experience, um, ignorance being influenced by malice. They're, they're not mutually exclusive. Yeah, there's I have a few, I have a few responses to this uh, with all due respect. And she goes on to say, I'm not defending the BBC because I work there. I work there because I defend it. Uh, I just spent 100 pounds or so on hold on international rates just trying to say all this. And I uh, hope you're feeling a bit better today. Left is best. Um, I would, uh, the only thing I would say is uh, for sure, use Skype. Use Skype. 
Yeah, please use Skype. Um, I I take the point about uh, calling. I mean, uh, yes, it's. I think a lot of people do call BBC state uh, media. I think I've gotten into the habit because I actually do think of the BBC World Service. Uh, but fair enough, I take that point. But I mean, there's been multiple examples, including uh, of the same person, Laura uh, uh, Kunzenberg, uh, uh sort of, I mean, even just tweeting, and this might sound uh, sort of not particularly serious, but it really is in the context of the election, sort of drawing an equivalency between Boris Johnson lying about checkpoints at the Northern Irish border in his Brexit deal, potentially, uh, with Jeremy Corbyn pretending to watch the Queen's Christmas speech. That's one thing that people really got upset at her about. Uh, there's at least two different instances, and we don't know why, where video has been edited. I mean, we played one on this show where an audience member asked Boris Johnson about honesty, and he says, well, I think that's really important. They all laugh at him. And then in the rerun package on BBC, the laughing is edited out. So, you know, I mean, I, 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 it's weird. It's tough when people send, you know, messages like this because I've had the same dynamic with people around NPR as an example. I right. have no doubt that there's plenty of people who work at NPR and the BBC who do great. I mean, I use the BBC, yeah. but I mean, I'm sorry. There is a massive media bias against Corbyn, and it is partially reflected in the BBC. It's also and it's, it's also and, problematic if you have a trusted source yes. that has burned you. You should be burning that sur source. Well, I mean, it's um, a question I mean, this of is just of a speed reaction, which you know, by the way, like I mean, I, we're all susceptible to, and I think a lot of people, increasing, including I'm sure myself, have made mistakes like that. But you're still going to get you know, you're still going to get slapped on the wrist by that, particularly when there is a broader, I mean, they've chosen to cover the anti-Semitism scandal in a certain way, which is not, you know, look, it's not, of course, they're not going to cover it the way the Tribune or I would cover it, but a objective one would certainly look at the Tory party problems, the alt-right stuff much more seriously. It would you know, it would it would be a little bit credulous. I mean, I, I'm sorry. BBC is absolutely biased against labor. And I don't know. But the where bottom that... line is that we can say is it's not state media. It's Fair enough. Has... We can call it, it is a I public mean, look, broadcaster. It, I mean, here, here's like, like I say. Of course, in my um, politics, state have... media does not necessarily mean a negative thing. Right. But it's just it's just about accuracy. Uh, but, um, you know, here we would say, um, you know, Stupid or evil is the way that we would say the malice versus ignorance because we're American and we don't use such big words as malice or ignorance. But uh, like I say, in my um, experience, uh, stupid people can be evil. And even if you're stupid and uh, you can either be uh, evil and a little stupid or stupid and a little evil. And uh, that ends up severely hampering you know uh, what you project onto tv in some ways it's you know i don't know which is worse but but you can be both and you can uh, and and and, and ignorant just ignorant enough to um trust you know the wrong sources or i should say uh ignorant enough that your evil sources <laughs> can fool you like there's you know there's uh, so uh, you really do have to look at the sort of the the results, but I do uh, I I do appreciate at the very least the clarification on the nature of the funding for the BBC, because that also opens up like it seems to me why can't we have we already do this with cable, right? I mean that's what cable access things are. We could actually create something like that. Put another fee on. Um, but uh, we will get to that. All right. In the meantime, <laughs> didn't it's not going to work. All right. Don't worry about it. Let's just pass then. Um, yes or no? Okay. 
You can still see the body language between you guys. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to play that clip of, uh, uh, you know, where Barbara Boxer, where we were talking about the USMCA. We'll, uh, maybe we'll do that later, but I don't think so. I think that's, that's done. All right. We're going to take a, a quick break here. But first, let me just remind you, this episode brought to you by Blinkist. The Blinkist app takes the key takeaways from thousands of best-selling nonfiction books, condenses them down just to 15 minutes, either in a reading format or a listening format. 10 million people are using Blinkist right now. It has a massive and growing library from self-help to business to health and history books. Right now, you can get 25% off your first year at Blinkist.com slash majority. Uh, also, a reminder, this program relies on your support. You can become a member by going to jointhemajorityreport.com. When you do, uh, you get the show commercial-free, and you get extra content virtually every single day, and you're supporting the show. All of those, it's a, it's a threefer, as we say. And... Um, uh, also, uh, sign up for the AM Quickie at amquickie.com. You can listen to both the shows on the app, which you can get for free at majorityapp.com. Kyle has been going crazy, updating, perfecting the app. I think we're there now. Uh, the iOS version and the Android version, check it out. It's a great um, way to listen to the show live, listen to it. Uh, you can IM the show. You can call the show. You can listen to the AM Quickie. All of it. It's all there for your listening and watching pleasure. And uh, lastly, justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Check out the coupon code majority, get 10% off. Check out the uh, majority report blend. Uh, last night was Tuesday night. Indeed. Michael, um, you're hungover. What happened? <laughs> if only it were so. Uh, it would be simple to, to solve the problem. Um, Last night, Camila Escalante joined us. Telesor, we talked about elections in Dominica, the Caribbean community, and Venezuela, uh, and fighting imperial interference from the U.S. across the Caribbean and Latin American region. Chris Nineham talked about the U.K. elections in the context of the British state, how it actually works, the sort of... Uh, institutional context of British politics. We talked about how to the danger of climate catastrophe turning into eco-authoritarianism with examples from Australia to Germany to the United States. And in the post game, we talked about what is the European centrist view in the age of populism, talking about the career of former German foreign minister Jaschke Fischer. We did the definitive debunk of Hillary Clinton on Howard Stern and a whole bunch more. Patreon.com slash TMBS. Michael Brooks Show on YouTube. Grab your tickets February 7th. The Bell House with incredible guests. Link in the blog description. Uh, got another correction. I think you'll find that um, we did the definitive debunk on, uh, Howard, on Hillary Clinton on Howard Stern earlier in the day. Oh, I thought you meant the one that I did last Thursday on this show. I didn't see that one. Oh, okay. Yeah, I wasn't paying attention to yours, so similarly couldn't comment. So you did it again. I did the more thorough one, <laughs> Matt, with the without the Clinton sympathy. Uh, yeah, folks, literary hangover. Most recently, we did the Crucible, that play by Arthur Miller. You might have read in uh, high school or middle school. Uh, we talk about the House and American Activities Committee background and how Arthur Miller was sort of used by both sides or attempted to use by both sides in the Cold War and uh, how he tried to stay neutral. And uh, so check it out, folks. All right, folks, uh, don't forget, uh, you can hear the Antifada at patreon.com slash the Antifada. Quick break, fun half. See you there. Left is best. Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock right, them so on YouTube. YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired that of the negativity. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. You're nervous, you're a little bit uh, upset, you're riled up. Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, 
you want to smoke this joint? Yes. <laughs> Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> <laughs> Good shit. Exactly. I'm happy now. It's a win-win. It's a win-win-win. Oh, hell yeah. Now listen to me. Two, three, four, five times. Eight, four, seven, nine, oh, six, five, oh, one, four, five, seven, two, thirty-eight, fifty-six, twenty-seven, one half, five, eight, three point nine billion. Wow. He's the ultimate math nerd. Don't you see? Why don't you get a real job instead of spewing vitriol and hatred, you left-wing limbaugh? Everybody's taking their dumb juice to Come on, Sammy! Dance, dance, dance! Grandpa! I had my first post-coital scene with uh, a woman. I'm hoping to add more moves to my repertoire. All I have is the dip and the swirl. Fine, we can double dip. Yes, this is a perfect moment. No. Wait, what? You make under a million dollars a year. You're scum. You're not paying. Excuse me? Fuck you, you fucking liberal elite. I think you belong in jail. Thank you for saying that, Sam. You're a horrible, despicable person. All right, going to take a quick break. I want to take a moment to talk to some of the libertarians out there. Take whatever vehicle you want to drive to the library. What you're talking about is jibber jab. Classic. I'm feeling more chill already. Donald Trump can kiss all of our asses. Hey, Sam. Hey, Andy. Are you guys ready to uh, do some evil... Hitler was such an idiot. You think I might be a Nazi? Agreed. No. Death to America. You. Yes. Wow. Wow, that's weird. No way! Unbelievable. This guy's got a really good hook. Throw our hands up. <laughs> Ooh. Sam, I gotta get off. No worries. Let's, 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 I want to just flesh this out a little bit. I mean, look, it's a free speech issue. If you don't like me... Hey, 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 shut up! Thank you for calling into the Majority Report. Sam will be with you shortly. Oh. Are we back? I was just asking about, uh, what happened to La Poupe? Then we realized it's gone. Oh, oh, careful, careful. It's with the old days. Like a fire, like a sword swallower there. Right. And we'll just, uh, then it'll all be, um, we'll all get, we'll get dinged. All right. Uh, let's just, uh, we, we do have this footage. I, I want to harp on this uh, too much, but it's an interesting dilemma with the uh, USMCA. This is the United States, Mexico, Canada agreement. Um, we spoke to Lori Wallach before. She basically said that the opportunity to get rid of the investment dispute uh, settlement, um, the ISDS, I can't uh, remember exactly what it, what it stands for. Investor State Dispute System? Investor State Dispute um, Settlement, uh, basically, which is a, a tribunal... That may sound a little more dramatic than it is, but a tribunal made up of literally of the lawyers who are going to be arguing to that same tribunal at a different time, rotating lawyers from corporations who determine how much profit corporations have been denied by government, uh, who is a, a party uh, to the agreement, has imposed uh, consumer labor, environmental protections, and how much profit uh, the company who anticipated and they didn't get, and so they're going to get awarded that money. And that has a chilling effect. I mean, in, in the, uh, on, on municipalities, on states, counties, countries, passing those laws if they know they have to pay, essentially, to do so. Getting rid of it in the new NAFTA, the value is not just in that new NAFTA, but also as a template for future trade agreements. It's not guaranteed, but, you know, these things make a difference. Valuable. But at the same time, you're also giving Donald Trump a big win. And, uh, you know, Richard Trumpka signing on to this. He's going to show up in, in, in ads. He's not going to like it. 
But uh, Barbara Boxer had a different idea than I did, uh, went on MSNBC to argue that despite the marginal value of this uh, trade agreement, you didn't have to do it now. And you certainly you're stepping all over impeachment and you're giving Donald Trump, you know, maybe a slight, slight edge. But let's not forget, he won the election last time after losing the popular vote and winning by 45,000 in Pennsylvania, by 20,000 in, uh, in Michigan, and uh, 12,000 in, in Wisconsin. Is this deal? And there are reasons for that. You know it's good when you have environmentalists saying, we've come a long way. When you have consumer protection people saying, hooray, the generics are going to compete with big pharma, you've got something here. And we all know, without Nancy Pelosi, and the way she handled this, this wouldn't have gotten done. So I think it's a terrific strategy. She protects, you know, her moderates. She'll keep control. And we already see the right She'll wing attacking control. it over in the Senate. It's going to cause Mitch McConnell, you know, a lot of uh, yeah. acid producing luncheons. Yeah, it, it is true. I will say that Mitch McConnell had very like tepid. Did you see his quote today? He was like, yeah. ah, it's not as good as I thought it would be. And we're going to take a recess. Yeah. What do you think, Sam, on the on the strategy of this about whether this makes sense or not? Well, I mean, I think the deal is a, a decent deal. It's marginally is a, is a marginal improvement over uh, NAFTA. But um, uh, when Richard Trumpka is used in an ad to support Donald Trump in in Michigan, in Wisconsin, in Pennsylvania, um, I think that's going to make a big difference, uh, and not in favor of the Democrats. I mean, this the 2018 election. That was so huge for the Democrats to win was one on negative partisanship. People were coming out to vote against Donald Trump. And so you had an election where you had plus eight uh, Democrat uh, 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 um, uh, performance. And frankly, you're going to lose maybe some of those frontline uh, seats in this election. But the bottom line is, are you going to beat Donald Trump? And this does not help beat Donald Trump. It muddies the water in terms of what the message is from the Democrats. What do you think about that, Senator? I just don't agree. I mean, if they dare use Richard Trumka in an ad for Trump and make him front and center, that will outrage labor. And the fact is, in this deal, which <laughs> Pat Toomey from the right has said is just awful, for the first time it says Mexico, Pause you have to second. allow workers... What does that mean? What, what does it mean, that outrage labor? What does that mean? Like what? What is what is it? Labor? Like all the labor people are like, how dare they use Richard Trumpka, who basically midwifed this deal for Donald Trump, in an ad touting the fact that he midwifed this deal for Donald Trump? That's how we uh, get a general strike in this country. Right. I mean, yeah, exactly. Like, what does that look like? Yeah. Well, in that case, we're going to double our efforts for the Democrats. Send out because of that ad. Emails. Like, what does that mean? It will outrage labor. It, it means nothing. It means nothing. Uh, somebody in the Hill is going to write about how outraged labor is. Or maybe there'll be a Politico article about it. In the meantime, the ad that uh, Donald Trump will have will just blanket those states. But they'll be outraged. America, we will enforce that. So, you know, I, I think because I was there so many years, 34 years, you take an oath to do your job when right. you hold up your so, hand. And you've got to get something done. And Nancy, P uh, Speaker Pelosi, did a genius job. She got everybody in the room from the left to the right of her caucus. I just think it's brilliant. So, I really do. So I want to distinguish between two things, right? So one is... The second thing Senator Boxer said, which I heard from a lot of Democrats on Capitol Hill, which I think is a totally defensible argument, which is basically like, look, you look at the legislation. If you think it's a good deal, you vote for it. You don't you don't say basically you don't do what McConnell did. You don't say we're not giving you a win because that'll be bad politics, even if you substantially support the thing. Yeah, well, I mean, that's nice. Mitch McConnell... <laughs> but you think that's a wrong reading of the politics? Well, I think it's a wrong reading of the politics. It's also a wrong reading of where this country is going to be. I mean, Donald Trump has been able, because of Mitch McConnell, to seat more circuit court judges almost than Barack Obama did in eight years. And he's yeah. done this in three years. 
And when we talk about, any, I mean, you can talk about any series. I mean, this is a very right. narrow piece of legislation that is right. going to maybe create 50,000 jobs. Maybe. Yeah. And I mean, we yes, talk the about difference the, between passing and not is not enormous in any way right. for the American. No one to make that right. argument. Right. And, and, and so, I mean, frankly, the bottom line is, is that it's all de uh, hands on deck time. That's what we've been hearing for the Democrats for three years. This undercuts that message dramatically. Let me ask you this, Senator, because I think this is an interesting dynamic. So no, pause you know it. Just, I just want the thing that you, you, we should see here. And I think this gives us really a sense of why Nancy Pelosi would do this. And I think it's really important to understand this dynamic. In my pea brain, I think Nancy Pelosi is the Speaker of the House. She is the most powerful Democrat in the country, at least, you know, arguably. She wants the Democrat. She wants to make sure that the Democrats like her first agenda is get Donald Trump out. President non Donald Trump. <laughs> and also she wants to get back the Senate. But I think when you hear Barbara Boxer defend this, this piece of legislation, and she says over and over again, Nancy Pelosi's a genius, yeah. and Nancy Pelosi's leadership is amazing, and she wants to keep power. I think the answer is Nancy Pelosi wants to keep power. And... We've talked about this in the past, particularly in the context of Nancy Pelosi. What is the iron law of, uh, of, of institutions of institutions? The bottom line is, how does Nancy Pelosi keep the Democrats in the majority in the House? And how does she maintain power over her caucus? Maybe she won't be the uh, Speaker of the House, but she will get to choose the one. She, <laughs> that's what she wants. And it's hard, I think, for a lot of us to sort of like grok that because we just don't have the mentality of someone who would be in that position. But the, the reality is, like, I think the presidency, control of the Senate, even though far more important in my mind than control of the House, is uh, secondary to her. But it's the Senate and it's the presidency that's going to make a difference in terms of like what happens with judges. But if Donald Trump has been able to do this in three years, imagine what he would do in eight. And by Donald Trump, I mean Mitch McConnell and Donald Trump. And if this helps get Donald Trump 0.01% more vote in those three states than just break even, it is a disaster. Continue. Is there any more? I don't know if we need to say any more. I think that was basically it. She was basically saying, oh, well, no, actually, there is more. Is it too late? Can we do it? Because the best is, like, I did, I wanted to say something else at the end here because of what she talks about, how, how forlorn Mitch McConnell is. This is what's wrong with, frankly, a generation of Democrats. And I am of this generation. So I'm not just, you know, this is not just, you know, banging on the olds, but the perspective of these Democrats is, is, I don't want to say twisted, but it's, it's, it's ossified. If anybody thinks that Mitch McConnell has lost anything, like the net for Mitch McConnell, then they really, really need to step back and, and one of the problems I think that the, the, this class of Democrats has is that they just don't know anybody who is subject to what is going on in this country, you know, b both in terms of Trump, but also that has been building for 30 or 40 years. The hearing for the Democrats for three years. This undercuts that message dramatically. Let me ask you this, Senator, because I think this is an interesting dynamic. So we know that the House Republican Caucus is dominated by essentially a, a, a fulcrum and a veto by its most conservative members. That was the case uh, under yeah. John Boehner and Paul Ryan. I talk to House Democrats who say that the people who pushed for this the most were those frontline members, right? The folks that in those 40 seats, particularly about 15 of whom really wanted this vote. So when you have a situation in which when the Republicans have control of the House, it's dominated by the right most of the caucus. And when Democrats have control of the House, it's also dominated by the right most of the caucus. I'll tell you why I don't agree with you. I voted against NAFTA. 
I've looked at this. I would vote for this deal. Now, people like Rosa DeLauro, they were on the committee that worked so hard for this yeah. agreement. Nancy didn't just go to the Nancy. middle of her caucus. She went from the left to the center That's a fair to the response, right yeah. of her caucus. And, and I just think, you know, everyone always questions her initially. And I think you got, you're going to see something really good. She said the American people want us to work. We have to work. I mean, that's what you're there for. And Mitch McConnell, he didn't do very well, you know, in the midterms. And he's not going to do very well, well the what? next time. Uh, People are sick of the Grim Reaper. He's got a 30 well, percent approval rating at home. Mitch That's McConnell did pretty well, pretty well in the midterms. They didn't do that well in the House. But Mitch McConnell picked up a not few really. seats, picked up has, a few seats in the Senate. To deal, he has to deal with Nancy Pelosi, and he is not a happy camper. Barbara, Boxer, Barbara Boxer and <laughs> Sam Cedar, uh, thank you so much. That is all I'm conceding. The Rachel Maddow Show. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, the, if you look at my face there, I'm, I, I, you know, the, she, what, 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 what Boxer did and she, I don't think she did this on purpose, but that's, that's basically how you, uh, that's basically, uh, what I would do when I would call into right wing, uh, uh, talk radio shows. I know when their break is and that's called slamming them into the post because I, I, I was ready to Mitch McConnell picked up seats in the Senate. Mitch McConnell, there is, it is impossible to contemplate, to contemplate a scenario where Mitch McConnell could do better. I don't even know what that would look like. Yes, his approval rating would be higher, but does anybody think that Mitch McConnell is going to lose what, whenever his next election is? When is his next election? It's not, it's this one. Does it, I mean, maybe, Maybe, but highly doubtful. And if he does, he's still going to go out as the mo single most successful leader of the Senate in terms of his really evil agenda. I mean, this, like, how blinkered do you have to be to think Mitch McConnell's really taking it on this one? Someone who's just not quite aware of the court system, not in this particular case, but thinking in large scope of his career yeah that's like messaging like an intern writes a fundraising email it's like no come on that's not really what's happening here it, it it's it's stunning like it's like phew. mcconnell was walking out of that senate thought he was going to get a hundred percent of things turns out 99.8 sorry guy you lose uh you, you, you just look i i i, I saw it because you can see the clock and it's like 8.59 and 59 seconds, and I'm like, shoot. Go ahead. Watch watch me as she's saying this stuff. It, it just, Mitch McConnell did pretty well, pretty well in the midterms. They didn't do that well in the House, but Mitch McConnell picked up a few Not seats. Not really. He picked he up has, a few seats in the Senate. To deal. He has to deal with Nancy Pelosi, and he is not a happy camper. Barbara, Boxer, Barbara Boxer and <laughs> Sam Cedar, uh, thank you so much. That is all in for this evening. <laughs> there you go. Oh, my God. That is uh, pretty stunning stuff. I mean, that's really, uh, that's part of the problem. Then, yes, I know she was also incredibly condescending to me, but uh, that is just the way that that goes. Look forward to the general strike after Trump uses Trumpka in the ad. Stop using Trumpka's picture. Stop using Trumpka's picture. Stop using his quotes. <laughs> hey, hey, ho, ho. <laughs> No more Trump get ads. Oh, ho. <laughs> you, almost, you almost had it. Nah. Those ads with Trump have to go. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> calling from a uh, 504 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Jesus. Hey, Sam. Uh, Jeff from Louisiana. How's it going? Jeff from Louisiana. What's on your mind? Hey, uh, I just I wanted to thank you um, for that piece you did last week on, I think it was the Radical Right. Um, that helps me a lot down here, kind of realizing, like, a lot of the stuff that gets lied to. Because um, I hear a lot of people, they say, like, you know, the Deep South is dumb. And, you know, the, you know people down, you know, but really it's just like, once you kind of educate yourself, it's, you kind of realize it's a lot of, you know, it's like the, you know, it's the lack of, like, unions and, like, all the education stuff, like the Reconstruction era situation um and so 
it's just, you know, I just wanted to thank you for all that, you know, and keep doing all the stuff that you do on that end. Um, all right. Well, thank you, Jeff. I appreciate it. That's uh, it's nice to get a call like that. Uh, call him from a 203 area code. Hey, Sam, this is Lou from New Haven. Lou from New Haven. What's on your mind, Lou? Hey, I'm talking about a guy named Travis Reynolds. He's scheduled to be executed today in Texas. And I was hoping that uh, some of your uh, fans could uh, maybe call the governor's office and, uh, or the Board of Pardons and Paroles to advocate for him. Travis Reynolds? We- <laughs> Did he not get a stay? No, this Texas is ex- executing a lot of people, Sam. Oh, unbelievable. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if I could just get you his. Um, so the governor Abbott's office, his number is 512-463-2000. And then you can call the Board of Pardons and Pearls as well. And their email address is on their website. And um, if you'd be interested in uh, advocating for more people, you can uh, go on the uh, National Coalition for the Abolition of the Death Penalty and uh, you can donate there. Thanks, Sam. Uh, thanks. Hey, will you send us uh, send us that information as an email too? Yeah, no problem, Sam. Who is the uh, the the head of 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 that national coalition? I can tell you. Um, I think I've interviewed I know him. They do some good. Work. Yeah, they do some good work. But um, I mean, if, this is an issue I don't think has been talked about enough, Sam. I mean, especially for your uh, your viewers who are interested in left politics, this kind of brutality is really synonymous with a, a really sick society, one that, you know, wants to leave people by the wayside, very cutthroat, deprives people of health care, pushes them out on the streets. And if, if you really want to work towards, a, you know, reining that all in, you have to start with excesses. And this is a very big excess of that. Yeah, uh, I, I, I agree. Um, and, you know, I... Uh, maybe it was someone else that... Um, I've I've interviewed uh, some folks. I don't know if it was from this organization uh, in the past, but um, we'll look more into it. I mean, it's you know, this is there was a time where it looked like we were going to have um, you know a broader movement in this country. I remember, I think it was um, maybe in two thousand when uh, Gore. I don't know if he had called out for a moratorium on the federal uh, death penalty. We have that now. Um, and, but uh, the Illinois, I think at that time, maybe this is back in 2000, but yes, I, I, and I appreciate it. Um, it's, it's Okay, Sam, I just want to, uh, it's, it's, it's scheduled today for 6 o'clock. I'm going to short notice, but the governor's office is 512-463-2000. Thank you so much, Sam. Okay, thank you. 512-463-2000 uh, is the uh, Texas governor's office, and uh, call and uh, support uh, for uh, Travis Reynolds. I mean, it really is um, barbaric. It's barbaric. I don't think there's any, personally, I don't think there's any justification for uh, the state to kill. Um, certainly not in, um, you know, I understand in the context of, of a defensive war, I think obviously there's a lot of times where well, I don't know when the last time we got in a defensive war was probably to World War II. But to in cold blood kill people in the name of the state, you're basically saying that it's okay to kill. Um, it's just really a question of like the reason and the authority. And then uh, to me, that's a little slippery slopey. Um, it's also, I mean, <laughs> you can also argue on, uh, on practical terms. It's expensive. We kill people who are not guilty. Um, it's a mistake that is very final. As you can see. Um, all right, let's uh, let's do a couple more of this uh, Horowitz Senate Judiciary hearings. Um, let's just start with number one. This is from Horowitz's opening statement. Look, the bottom line of this is that there are problems with the FISA process, which is 
ultimately, even though in this instance, and, and they're going to be investigated, the lawyer who apparently like changed um, information about in sort of the later Carter Page FISA warrants, changed information that went into the packet, which was that the CIA had basically informed this lawyer that Carter Page is a is a source, and he basically stripped that late in the um, in the you know one of the renewals of his FISA uh, warrant. But that was not the catalyst for this investigation. Carter Page was a side story in the context of this investigation. Um, to a certain extent, that became apparent when he kept showing up on TV. Not, uh, and, and sort of uh, talking rather wildly. The bottom line is, is that the investigation into the Trump campaign crossfire hurricane was found by the Department of Justice Inspector General to be open for an authorized purpose. Here he is saying that in his opening remarks. 2016 meeting with the friendly foreign government, Trump campaign foreign policy advisor George Papadopoulos suggested, quote, suggested the Trump team had received some kind of a suggestion, close quote, from Russia that it could assist in the election process with the anonymous release of information during the campaign that would be damaging to candidate Clinton and then President Obama. Following receipt of that information, the FBI opened Crossfire Hurricane. Given the nature and sensitivity of such an investigation, we would have expected FBI personnel to faithfully adhere to the FBI's detailed policies, practices, and norms. The FBI has developed and earned a reputation as one of the world's premier law enforcement agencies, in significant part because of its adherence to those policies and its tradition of professionalism, impartiality, and non-political enforcement of the law. However, our review identified significant concerns with how certain aspects of the investigation were conducted and supervised, particularly the FBI's failure to adhere to its own standards of accuracy and completeness when filing applications with the foreign surveillance intelligence, applications for Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act Authority, known as FISA, to surveil Carter Page, a U.S. person who was connected to the Trump for President campaign. We determined that the decision to open Crossfire Hurricane was made by the then FBI Counterintelligence Division's Assistant Director, Bill Priestap, and that his decision reflected a consensus reached after multiple days of discussions and meetings among senior FBI officials. We reviewed Department and FBI policies, and concluded that Assistant Director Priestap's exercise of discretion in opening the investigation was in compliance with those policies. We also reviewed, as we detail in the report, the emails, text messages, and other documents of those involved in that decision, and particularly Mr. Priestap's, and we did not find documentary or testimonial evidence that indicated political bias or improper motivation influencing his decision to open the investigation. While the information in the FBI's possession at the time was limited, in light of the low threshold established by Department and FBI predication policy, which, by the way, is not a legal requirement, okay. but rather a prudential. Okay, that's good. I mean, we got enough there. And, and let's also just add the quote that is in, this is clip number one. reviewed Department and FBI policies and concluded that Assistant Director Priestap's exercise of discretion in opening the investigation was in compliance with those policies. We also reviewed, as we detail in the report, the emails, text messages, and other documents of those involved in that decision, and particularly Mr. Priestap's, and we did not find documentary or testimonial evidence that indicated political bias or improper motivation influencing his decision to open the investigation. While the information in the FBI's possession at the time was limited, in light of the low threshold established by Department and FBI predication policy, which by the way is not a legal requirement, but rather a prudential one in the, in the FBI and Department policies, we found that Crossfire Hurricane was open for an authorized investigative purpose and with sufficient factual predication. Okay, so there it is. I mean, um, 
the the bottom line is the investigation uh, according to the inspector general was opened under the proper auspices and under this proper factual basis um at the end of the day we don't need to play number two at the end of the day there is a problem with the FISA process, and this has been a problem that has existed since, I think, probably since its inception, which is this is a rubber stamp court. And so you have the FBI lawyer has an ability to change documents that end up in the application, and there's no process in which to apparently to determine if any of this stuff is legit. It's been a rubber stamp for a long time, and that is a problem. But that is a problem with FISA, the FISA court. And I'm glad that uh, some on the right are now paying attention to this. It'd be nice if, you know, w- at one point we do something about this. You got the civil libertarians in there now. Exactly. But um, the bottom line is the investigation, nevertheless, was still uh, legit. And now let's play one more clip from the IG testimony. This is going to be um, hard for, I think, Sean Hannity to hear. But apparently, Lisa Strzok and Peter, Peter Strzok and Lisa Page, the two lovebirds, their text messages, inappropriate, nothing to do with the launching of the investigation. And in the investigation. There is a lot of misimpression about two people, Strzok and Page. So I want to ask this question. For the last two years, President Trump has relentlessly attacked former FBI officials as a way to undermine the investigation. For example, the president tweeted that, and I quote, how can the wicked witch witch hunt proceed when it was started, influenced and worked on, by Peter Strzok and Lisa Page, who exchanged text messages critical of candidate Trump. Your investigation found that while Lisa Page attended some of the discussions regarding the opening of the investigations, she did not play a role in the decision to open Crossfire Hurricane. You also found that while Strzok was directly involved in the decisions to open Crossfire Hurricane, He was not the sole or even the highest level decision maker to any of those matters. That decision, as I understand it, was made by FBI (coughs) Assistant Director Priestap, as you have indicated, and by consensus after multiple days of discussions of meetings. Most importantly, you found that the decision had a proper factual basis and that there is no evidence that, quote, political bias or improper motivation influenced it. So, based on your investigation, personal political views expressed in text messages did not motivate the opening of the investigation of ties between Trump campaign advisors and Russia. Is that correct? That's correct. Ultimately, we concluded that those text messages, which we found last year were entirely inappropriate, didn't ultimately make play this play the role in Mr. Priestap's decision to open the investigation. Thank you. So your investigation also uncovered text messages between other FBI employees expressing support for candidate and President Trump, correct? That's correct. So FBI employees held personal political views that were both favorable and unfavorable Mm -hmm. toward the candidate at that time. That's correct. And as we note here, and and we noted in last year's report. um, Yeah, right. That's all we need there. So you had both lovebirds. Lovebirds, but then the people who love me were just good FBI agents. That's the way it works. Lovebirds. Lovebirds. So now, of course, anticipating this testimony that we heard today from the Inspector General Horowitz, who made it clear, I mean, really, the bottom line is this. Look, I'm glad. We should have an Inspector General look at every FISA application, frankly. 
They, I mean, I think if anything, there are two things that come out of these the hearings with Horowitz. One is the investigation was open properly. The second is we need some type of like IG specifically for the FISA court who should be going through each application or randomly picking one. You know, I don't know how many go through a year. Quality control. Exactly. Exactly. This should be ongoing. But for our purposes uh, today, anyways, at least in the context of uh, the era we live in, the question is, is um, what will happen now with Bill Barr and uh, John Durham, is it? Their investigation, now that the inspector general has said, I asked them for any information that would suggest that their theory about this investigation was true, and they gave me nothing. Well, what you do is you send out your client to give a rally and to crap all over the report, even the night before that it was actually released, or I should say the testimony was released. Here's Donald Trump in Hershey, Pennsylvania. He's got a campaign. Pennsylvania, he knows it's a big state for him. Hershey, Pennsylvania. Um, this is him explaining that uh, some FBI agents, not nice people, number four. And the FBI also sent multiple undercover human spies to surveil and record people associated with our campaign. Look how they've hurt people. They've destroyed the lives of people that were great people, that are still great people. Their lives have been destroyed by scum, okay, by scum. An FBI lawyer forged, took a email, forged, forged an email used as evidence an act which is now the subject of a criminal referral, okay? Oh what they did criminal is so <laughs> unbelievable. Oh, I look forward, I don't know, I don't know, I keep away. I look forward to Bull Durham's report. That's the one I look forward to. And this report was great wait, by wait. the IG especially since he was appointed by President Barack Hussein Obama. Okay. Now, as far as I know, the guy's name is John Durham, right? Bull Durham, of course, was a movie with Kevin Costner about baseball. I'm looking forward to Bull Durham's report. There you go. The scum the scum. Well, uh, the IG reports that there was no, there was no human spying. Um, I, I don't know why that would be the issue. If the investigation was opened legitimately, then it was opened legitimately. But the scum. Uh, Donald Trump was really in fine form last night, fine tuning uh, the fascism. But let's just play one more clip where uh, Donald Trump says uh, that the Inspector General report on the investigation, clip number six, shows that the FBI leadership, not good people. Now, the reason why he's doing this is because uh, Christopher Wray went out and characterized and basically pushed back on Bill Barr's characterization of the Inspector General report before it was released, and as it was being released, before the testimony by Horowitz today, where Ray said, look, we've got problems with FISA. We're going to address those. To my mind, necessary, but not sufficient in terms of addressing FISA. But the report made it clear that the investigation into Donald Trump and the campaign was legitimate. Trump can't let that stand. So they tried to frame innocent people in the... A ludicrous. It all started with the Russia witch hunt, right? <laughs> then the Inspector General's shocking report proved that the Obama FBI obtained secret warrants to spy on my campaign based on a phony foreign dossier of debunked smears, 
paid for by crooked Hillary Clinton and the DNC. The FBI failed to disclose the nature of the political hit job to the FISA court. They hid it, they deceived it, and they lied. The dossier was written by a discredited foreign agent who, quote, desperate that Donald Trump not get elected and was passionate about him not being the United States president. What's this? They, folks, <laughs> they spied on our campaign, okay? okay. They spied. Never happened before in the history of our country. And we're really wise to it. We're wise to it. The Inspector General found that the FBI's spying application contained 17 errors and omissions commonly known as lies and deceit. When the FBI, and you have great people in the FBI, but not in leadership, you have not good people in leadership you haven't had, when the FBI uncovered evidence showing that we did absolutely nothing wrong, which was right at the beginning, they hid that exonerating. You know that. They hid it. Exactly. They hid it so nobody could see it, so they could keep this hoax going on for two years. Oh, my God. This is like Sam Kinison, uh, like a really <laughs> bad Sam Kinison set. He's just yelling. Yeah. It's it's nuts. It's amazing how he goes through this narrative and he has his little catchphrases like the like crooked Hillary and the DNC, like kind of just to keep everyone's get everyone's attention back. Right, like you exactly. remember crooked Hillary and right. the DNC? What, what, like it, it's it is like like one of those uh, comics from the eighties who have their hook, yeah. and that's what I've been saying. You know, it's one of those jobbies. Um. We got uh, just a couple more clips of this because uh, Trump was in fine form, and we're going to see more of this, folks, going forward. It's important to know what <laughs> what they're saying in these things. Um, here's Trump. Um, one more thing about this uh, the, about the impeachment. Now um, he's upset. He released the the, the transcript of the Ukraine call. Because, um, because it was so perfect. Because it was such a perfect call, and somehow it allowed the whistleblower. He's acknowledging now that you didn't need to hear from the whistleblower. So when I said release it, and I don't like doing that, because you're releasing it, it's a conversation with a foreign leader. In this case, a very fine gentleman, president of Ukraine, the new president of Ukraine. And we call them up. And we said, would it be okay? Our Secretary of State made the call. Would it be okay? And they didn't know what we were talking about. But they said, yeah, it's okay. And by the way, he, his foreign minister, everybody, did you know they said, there was no pressure. He didn't do anything wrong. There was no pressure put on us. That didn't stop anybody. No collusion. But we released the conversation, and that gummed it up. Now, all of a sudden, we never heard from the second whistleblower. We never heard about who the informer was. The whistleblower who's going to come out strong, he's disappeared. Where's the whistleblower? He's disappeared. He's gone. Maybe our great congressman can find him, OK? But the whistleblower is gone. He flew the coop because he reported incorrectly. And the IG, who didn't want to look at the conversation, he was so anxious to turn the whistleblower report over to Congress so that Congress could have fun with it or to be ashamed of himself. But today, the House Democrats announced these two. There you go. Attacking the inspector general now of uh, the National Security Council. Uh, I, I mean, at one point, we're not there yet, but, I, you know, the, the, the thing that terrifies me about the second term is that it just feels like the, what we're witnessing now is just a warm up. When there is no, when there, I mean, you know, for Donald Trump right now, his perspective has got to be like, I got to get reelected or I'm going to jail. When he thinks that like, I can't get reelected. I'm just going to make the most of the, like he, the, the, 
Obama the got assault, reelected and I can't get elect, reelected. The, but the assault on the structures of our government, I think we are just literally just seeing, this is just a, a preview. Um, and I think also, you know, the fact is, is that, I mean, I'm feeling it the past couple of weeks, like four years, man, hard. But the idea of facing another four years of this, if you're in the government, <laughs> you know, you've been just sort of hanging on bare knuckle, like we're just going to make it another 12 months. But if he wins re-election. Speaking of things to be um, worried about, Donald Trump, uh, of course, is back on. We all remember the, 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 the big anti-immigrant push was all about uh, MS-13 and uh, immigrants killing Americans. Well, campaign starts in earnest, I think, probably in his mind, uh, you know, a couple months ago, but we're ramping it up. And he's just... They say that uh, Pennsylvania between Philadelphia and Pittsburgh is essentially Alabama. Here's some of his... Uh, Here's some of his, his pitch for the uh, 2020 election. Thanks to Democrat immigration policies, innocent Americans in all 50 states are being brutalized and murdered by illegal alien criminals. Last summer, at least 19 illegal aliens were charged in connection with grisly homicides, including hacking victims to death, and ripping out, in two cases, their hearts. Weeks ago, two illegal aliens and members of the savage gang MS-13, who we are removing from our country by the thousands. Pause it. He's been removing MS-13 gang members by the thousands for three years. How many thousands upon thousands of MS-13 gang members do we have here? But... They don't care. They just like that story. Continue. We're charged with relentlessly beating a wonderful, beautiful high school teenager to death with a baseball bat and chopping the body apart with a machete. One of the animals accused was previously released by local authorities in defiance of an ICE demand. I swan and said, you can't let him go. They wanted him. They would do anything for him. They wanted them to hand this animal over for deportation back to his country. Get him the hell out of our country, right? Yeah, there you go. I mean, this is like, a, you know, one of those Black Mirror episodes. The, this is uh, the, the, you know, the one where they like, uh, they, they inject the soldiers with the thing that makes the the immigrants look like literally like aliens. Uh, I haven't seen that one. Oh, yeah. I thought you were going to say the Black Mirror episode by Lenny Riefenstahl. No, exactly. Uh, this is, I mean, uh, it's not anything particularly new, but it's, they're going to lean on this a lot more. And they have the apparatus now. It's super ugly. At least, you know, it's one thing for Donald Trump to be going into Hershey, Pennsylvania and talking about how immigrants are dirty and they're murdering people and um, they're disgusting. At least you don't see that like non-Donald Trump people saying that like on the news, like Tucker Carlson and Seth Barron from the City Journal. At least they're not going out and spreading those kinds of uh, hateful lies. We're connoisseurs of irony on the show, but if you claim to care about the environment, you think that the little piece of America you're responsible for that you represent in the Congress would be clean, but hers isn't. Why? Well, uh, part of the reason is because uh, her district is actually one of the least American districts in the country. And by that, I, I don't mean that it's not part of America, but it's occupied by relatively few American citizens. Occupied. Uh, a, a very high percentage of, of her district is, in fact, illegal aliens. 
Um, now, the way they inhabit housing there is such that they live in a lot of illegal spaces, like basements, and many people live there. So they wind up producing a lot of garbage that the landlords don't want thrown out normally. So hence, you wind up with a lot of garbage on the streets. You have illegal food vendors pouring their pig grease into the gutters. Yeah, I mean, I worked out there. It's, it's, it can be a little gross. Yeah, these talking about uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, uh, the New York 14th District. Um, I think that district has like more of a population than some states, half the states. I don't know, it's about 700,000 people in there. About as much as North Dakota. You think there's as many Amer uh, Americans there, maybe? North Dakota's very American, if you know what that, Super American. If you know what Tucker means. Yes. We know what we're talking about with uh, American. Right? What's the City Journal? I mean, I'm looking it up by the Manhattan Institute. I guess yes. that explains it. There you go. It's nice. I used to look uh, work up there. Not a lot of uh, uh, real Americans. That's why it's so dirty. Unbelievable. They inhabit basements. <laughs> exactly. Well, I like the, how they're occupying. Yeah. They're, they're like like a, they're, they've invaded. I mean, this is all very conscious use of language, and um, it's disgusting, obviously. But it is what it is, folks. Calling from a five one zero area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Five one zero. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, I'm sleepy, California. What? Sleepy from California? Yeah, Felipe from California. Oh, Felipe from California. Um, okay, what's on your mind, Felipe? Uh, nothing. Just called in. Like the show you guys do. What? I said no, I just called in because I like the show you guys do. All right. Well, thank you. That's uh, that's very nice. I appreciate your your hanging on the line to tell me that. It's working, uh, and it's very exciting. All right. Well, uh, we'll we'll talk later. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Nice feedback. Yeah, it's nice to hear uh, positive feedback. Calling from a nine five six area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Uh, hello. Hello. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Uh, uh, I'm uh, Josiah. I'm calling from uh, South Texas. Josiah from South Texas. What's on your mind? Uh, yeah, I wanted to talk about uh, uh, the USMCA. Yep. Uh, I was uh, I was listening to the uh, to the conference uh, yesterday. Okay. Uh, yeah. The the subsecretary for uh, North America for Mexico, uh, Jesus uh, Ciade Curi, he was talking about. Uh, I think it's, it's, we, I think the U.S. is going to have a like a panel, something like that, like a group of panelists. So it's going to be like judges, right? So uh, the U.S. Uh, so the U.S. is going to have a list, and Mexico is going to have a list, and Canada is also going to have a list. So when there's a, a dispute between the countries, uh, what they're going to do is that Mexico is going to choose a a panelist from the U.S. list, and uh, U.S. is going to choose a panelist from the Mexico list. And then apparently they're going to have a, a coin toss to choose a, a, a third panelist. And let's suppose that they found, they found an, uh, an irregularity. Yeah. I think they're going to have uh, uh, 85 days to fix it. Uh, also, I was listening to Andres Manuel Amlo. Uh, he was talking about, uh, I believe he asked uh, Pelosi to to allow the deal to to go through. Uh, he also thanked uh, Pelosi for for letting it go through. Um, so I don't know. Uh, he said that uh, at least for, from uh, Mexico, uh, he thinks it's going to help the the economy on, on Mexico. Well, I mean, uh, 
I, I you know, we'll see. Um, and I think, you know, uh, you know, I think there's there, there seems to be a broad consensus that this is not a bad trade deal as far as they go and that um, they do offer at least some uh, protections for Mexican workers. It's unclear as to, you know, sort of how stringent uh, the enforcement mechanism is. Um, I think really the the question that that I, I continue to have is uh, a political one and um, whether there wasn't an opportunity to get a even better version of this down the road. And will the cost of having uh, the potential cost of having Donald Trump win reelection be worth it now? Uh, you know, it's not something that we're ever going to be able to really assess in the in the final analysis of things but um you know i i do think it is a a fairly strong argument that the the that the deal in and of itself is not a bad one but i appreciate the college Um uh, it's a novel way to settle disputes like that it is. I mean, that is, I think, part of what, um, you know, uh, uh, Lori Wallach was saying is that there's uh, we're creating a different model than the uh, ISDS. Call from a 402 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Is that? Hello. Hi. Hey. Is this me? Yeah, it is. Hello. Hi. This is Ham Saris. Uh, Calling from second. Okay, no problem. Water's off, right? Sorry. How's it going, Todd? You got some plumbing issues? Hello. This is him. This is him, Saris, from the Randian Bizarro universe. I wanted to note that the invective pedantry on full display on this show fundamentally mischaracterized my real world devil. His dissent with Chomsky was over the relevance of intent with the U.S. in <clears throat> that when the U.S. needs to torture and bomb brown, I mean radical Islamic jihadists, that your intent is uh, objective. Okay. I mean, that's uh, it's not a bad uh, Sam Harris impersonation, but I, I just, we got too many people on the Back line. to the workshop. Yeah, I mean, I, I I would continue to to work on it. Um, it's a long time to hold. I mean, having like the plumber uh, step on the front of it wasn't helpful either. That was not. Yeah, I don't think Sam Harris deals with his plumber. Calling from a two zero eight area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Two zero eight. Two zero eight. Going once. Going twice. Bye. Calling from an 831 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Eight three one. Eight three one. Are you there? Oh, that was my fault. Ah, that happens. Thank you for calling into the majority report. Please use no speaker phone and give your now one feel, comment or question. Now room. I feel bad for that other uh Sam to call out your area code. Sam will be with you shortly. Oh, I gotta wait until I show up in the system, folks. Bear with us. Uh let's play this clip. Pramila Jayapal. They won a big I, I I need to see more reporting on this, but I think the Progressive Caucus. Um just basically leveraged, and I don't know how much the USMCA was a uh, part of this or not. I mean, this is one of those things where, you're like, you got to wait like a couple of weeks and uh, maybe a week, and you start to start to see some of the reporting as the people go through this. But um, Pramila Jayapal, uh, one of the co-chairs of the Congressional Pro uh, Progressive Caucus, they have gotten a lot tougher, and they were going to bring down behind AOC. This drug bill that Nancy Pelosi was pushing. But they got more provisions in there. You got expansions of, uh, of, of the drugs that they wanted to get in terms of the list. Now, this is all symbolic. It's not going to get passed by the Senate. But this is the baseline for when Democrats do take the Senate and the presidency. Knock on wood. 
In the meantime, uh, Pramila Jayapal was at the House Energy and Commerce uh, Committee, um, basically arguing that we not only can we afford single payer, we can afford we can't afford not to have single payer. Our nation's health care system is the most expensive in the world. Contemplate that. This year, we will spend almost $3.9 trillion, or 18% of our GDP, on health care expenditures. And that is almost double what every other industrialized country in the world spends. Over the next decade, our current health care system will cost America about $55 trillion. What does that astronomical spending get us? The highest maternal and child mortality rates among our peer countries and the lowest life expectancy. It gets us 500,000 Americans who every year are forced into bankruptcy because of medical costs. It gets us 70 million people who still remain uninsured or underinsured. And that is just a bad deal. Why is America so far behind our peer countries? You might ask that. Because profit-making motives are baked into our system, and our healthcare system incentivizes putting profits over patients. For-profit insurance companies with extremely high administrative waste stand between Americans and good quality, affordable health care. There you go. Pushing back against the um, the stuff that folks like Hillary Clinton are trying to put out there. I don't know. She's not running for anything anymore, but she just really feels strongly that it should not be um, things like uh, Medicare for all or the opportunity for everyone to have access to a public option of uh, for college. It's good to hear. Let's go to the phones. Calling from an eight three one area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hi, this is uh, Ryan from Santa Cruz. Ryan from Santa Cruz. What's on your mind? Hi, so I'm a graduate student worker here at the University of California, Santa Cruz, um, and we just uh, organized uh, a uh, wildcat strike against the university for low wages um, and in support of a uh, cost of living adjustment. Oh, great. Um, when, yeah, did it, we, um, when did it start? Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, when did it start? It um, started this weekend. Um, basically, um, <clears throat> just to give you a quick overview of the timeline, uh, we have a really shitty contract, uh, excuse my language, uh, that was approved by the statewide union. And 85% um, of uh, UC Santa Cruz graduate students uh, voted against it, um, but it, it kind of eked through. It got, like, I think 51 to 49. Anyway, so we're stuck with a really terrible contract. We've got um, cost of living, you know, for one-bedroom apartments about um, $2,500. Uh, we're paid about $20,000 a year when you subtract the fees and stuff. And, um, you know, over the past month, we... Uh, we put the system on notice. We had, there was a big protest um, um, in front of the chancellor's office. 250 people um, were there. Um, they said they would work on it. They've done nothing. Um, they've attacked us. They've insulted us. Um, and eventually we just voted to uh, break with our contract and strikes. Um, all but one of our um, the heads of our uh, union uh, resigned in, um, in order to support the protest and uh, to support the strike. Um, the faculty have signed on. Um, we got 400 uh, professors have signed on in their um Will you explain... Faculty. Will you explain why people had to had to had to resign as union leaders to support this strike? Yes, because um, if they were supporting it, they could suffer legal action um, from the university, um, essentially, um, for breaking the contract and striking. We have a no strike clause, unfortunately. Wow, because why? Because yeah. you guys are public workers. Yeah, I mean, I don't know the exact details of that. I'm a little fuzzy on that, but essentially, I think it's um, that. Yeah. Yeah, we'd have to vote for a strike with the full and have the full union support behind it, basically. Interesting. Um, and so, do do people have a sense of like how long this is going to go on? Um, what, what's um, until we get a until we get a cost of living adjustment? <laughs> um, um, where can people? This is a grading strike as well, so we're not submitting grades. Um, and per the um, I should say the faculty association have um, advised the faculty. To um, support that and not to try and submit grades if um, if they have graduate students that are participating in the strike. Interesting. And um, and, and so, oh, sorry, go ahead. where where can people go to maybe support? I mean, obviously, like, are you guys picketing every day? What what do you what what, yeah. what, what can people do both locally website, and uh, not yes, so locally? Com. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Say again. Yeah, we have a website. Payusmoreucsc.com. UCFC. 
Okay. It has a bunch of information, FAQs for um, faculty, for uh, undergraduate students. Um, I will say, too, we're working with undergraduate students, anyone who's in a situation um, you know, um, where they may lose financial aid or anything like that, we have ways of getting around this. Um, and the UC has um, explicitly stated that undergraduate students will not suffer any repercussions um, as a result of this um, on their financial aid or their academic standing. Great. All right, well... Um, but unfortunately... Yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry, go right ahead. No, you go ahead. Um, unfortunately, the university um, has been basically putting out propaganda, calling our strike illegal, but it is not, it is not illegal in any way. Um, and we've had, um, you know, for the most part, a lot of strong support, but we've also had threats of violence um, from, you know, kind of unhinged undergraduates. And when um, the admin is, is calling us um, what we're doing illegal and, um, you know, a work stoppage, which is not true, we're, we're continuing to work, um, that, that just um, helps propagate those, that kind of violence and things like that. So wait, what do you mean by you're continuing to work? Uh, I, 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 how do, I'm not sure I follow. Okay, yeah. So essentially, the way that we've decided to do this strike is that we're performing all of the, we're proctoring exams, we are um, continuing to show up, we're just simply not submitting grades, and they're not going to get the grades unless we get a cost of living adjustment. Interesting. And, yep. <laughs> no, that's an interesting uh, technique. It's, so you're sort of just sort of like, and there's nothing specific in your contract that calls for grades? Um, it, no, this is this is a violation of our contract to do this. So we're at risk. Um, I've specifically put myself at risk, um, and you know, honestly, the, the reality is I'm moving. I, I don't even know if I'll be completing my PhD at this point. Um, I've just seen too many people suffer, and I can't deal with it. So, um, you know, basically half of the graduate students are um, striking. There's 400 of us plus, um, and they can't fire us all. Well, good for you. What's your name? Uh, Ryan Page. Ryan, okay. Uh, well, Ryan, thanks so much uh, for uh, the call, and uh, keep us updated, all right, will you? We'll keep an eye out yeah, for absolutely. you. Can I see one more thing, Sam? Yeah. just want to shout out to my brother-in-law, Masood, for uh, pointing you guys out to me about a year and a half ago. I've been watching you every day since. Okay, great. Well, uh, good luck with the strike, and, uh, you know, uh, folks, we will put a link uh, to pay us more USFC. USSC. US. UCSC. UCSC. UC, w- Pay us more UCSC. Pay us more UCSC. Uh, yep. Dot com. We really appreciate the call, Ryan. Thank you. All right. That's cool. I have uh, um, a lot of knowledge as to, at the very least, you know, like how much adjuncts get paid. I mean, they're just, it, the, the university system is broken. When you think of the exorbitant hikes in tuition and the simultaneous like sort of like cutting of what they dedicate in terms of resources to teaching and 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 maybe they haven't cut it on like a like an average basis but a median basis they have right like i mean they're so they're paying like four i don't know how many a small group of uh, professors get a huge amount of money because they publish and they're like sort of lost leaders. And then they pay virtually nothing to the vast majority of people who do the teaching. It's messed up, folks. Super messed up. Call from a 570 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Uh, hi, Sam. Uh, this is uh, Tom from rural Pennsylvania. Tom from rural Pennsylvania. How are you? I am fantastic. Uh, first off, I'd like to uh, thank you and uh, Michael in particular for um, the content that you guys pull out. Uh, uh, put out. <laughs> um, pull out. Uh, it's been very helpful for me to, uh, um, you know, sort of expand my horizons. Um, but uh, aside from that, um, I, you know, I've been. I'm sorry. I'm a little nervous. So well, I'm a little bit nervous too. <laughs> um. Yeah, so uh, I've been thinking a lot about the uh, presidential primaries, and um, um, I think now we're kind of getting to the point where uh, major candidates or or people who were once thought to be major candidates are starting to drop out now. Um, And uh, I've seen, you know, Bernie kind of eking up in the polls a little bit, and um, as people drop out, um, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, some more of the uh, progressive uh, vote coalesces uh, onto Bernie's side rather than being misled by 
uh, people like you know, Bougez or something. Um, but um, uh, I, I've been kind of disappointed. Um, not 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 in really Bernie Sanders, but the the left in general. Um, I haven't really uh, heard much. Oh, wow, I'm finding it hard to breathe. I'm so nervous. Uh, but uh, dude, you're doing fine. You're doing fine. Don't worry about a thing. You're yeah, disappointed sorry. in the left because you haven't heard much about what. All right, I'm not. I'm not really disappointed. I, I just think there's a real missed opportunity here uh, uh, for um, that. Maybe uh, Andrew Yang is sort of uh, seizing on where um, the likes of uh, maybe Bernie is is, is sort of uh, maybe uh, brushing aside or, or not focusing on um, in uh, the uh, focus on automation, not so much the UBI stuff. Uh, by the way, I completely support uh, Bernie Sanders. He is absolutely necessary, right, uh, for our country and for the the, the planet. But um, uh, I, I, I've noticed um, that the right has no intellectual um, response to the problem of automation. There's it's it's only a denial that the problem exists, and. Um, you know, I, I think um, that Andrew Yang has a lot of um, a surprising amount of independent support here um, in certain parts of uh, Pennsylvania, actually, uh, amongst the more conservative leaning uh, independent uh, type people. There are a lot of independent voters here. Um, back in 2016, it was all Trump and all Bernie and everyone hated Hillary Clinton. Right. And um, there was a lot of agreement on that. Um, but I, I've noticed in my, my personal conversations with people that um, when they ask me, you know, why am I, uh, why do I identify as a socialist? Why do I like Bernie Sanders? I explain that, you know, I'm a younger guy, um, and uh, you know, I, I, I I've, I've been lucky enough to get one of the last uh, manufacturing, good manufacturing jobs in the area. And every day or every week or so, we get internal company emails, and they're always talking about automation, how we mm. need to automate, 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 cut costs, you know. Um, and a lot of people just brush it aside, but, you know, I have a real focus and uh, fear surrounding um, the, all this talk around automation. And I, I think it's a fear that's shared amongst um, a lot of people who are on the edge who can be sort of brought over to see the um the progressive side of things uh, and so what, so let me let me ask no... you this let me ask you this so is it yeah. just simply yeah. that yang acknowledges the problem of automation because i i mean frankly mm-hmm. i think it's to the extent that it's a problem it is fairly localized or i should say it is i don't think it's as broad of a base of a problem as he says it is i mean <clears throat> the, we've had Automation is like an ongoing thing that we've had in this country for decades upon decades. Um, and it is true that it, what it ends up doing is it ends up being disruptive uh, for specific, you know, people and in specific industries and in specific jobs within that industry. Um, is it just simply that Yang addresses it and acknowledges it that resonates, do you think? Uh, I think it's more that it's um, he almost mentions it almost all the time, uh, and it, it's really more of a focus. It's not it's not that he just mentioned it once or twice. I wouldn't. What's that his have solution? Anyone's attention. Let me uh, let me ask you this uh, a different way. What's his solution? What's his solution? Uh, well, his solution is the the UBI right. you know nonsense. And uh, I'm at, I'm with your you guys and your your. Uh, uh, your your analysis of the situation that uh, his no. type of UBI is, is the not reason a, why I ask a, is this a good solution. I do think that mm-hmm. within the context of politics, there is a tremendous value in just simply acknowledging people's anxieties, and you don't even necessarily have to provide an answer. You know exactly. Well, I mean. That that is just the nature of politics. Like you know, uh, the the acknowledging of people's anxieties leads them to believe, like, well, at the very least, I'm being heard. And you know, often I think mistakenly so, but often the 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 next thought is, and they must be addressing my problem because they know it, 
And so I think there's something to that. Um, I think broadly yeah. speaking, Sanders addresses sort of like anxiety of workers, whether he specifically says uh, about automation, I don't know. And I would tend to think that it, it is secondary because in the reality it is secondary. Uh, but um, yeah. I, yeah. I appreciate. I, I agree that that in the, in, the, in the reality of the situation, that it is sort of secondary, and that the, the real focus is, um, you know, uh, corporate power and, and, and dealing with that. But uh, on like a sort of political level, yeah, there is a um, rapidly increasing anxiety about this, and uh, I, I really think that's a missed opportunity because, like I said, there is no right wing response. Uh, to this issue. It's just a denial that it's going to ever be an issue. And, you know, people's um, lived experiences you know, I, I, are I different. That, All right. Well, look, yeah, no, I think, that, no, I think people's lived experience is different, but I appreciate the call. And, um, okay. uh, in, <laughs> interesting to see if, if, if Bernie picks up that mantle, particularly as he moves into, you know, as we get closer to those specific States, um, you know, the, the value of being a candidate who doesn't necessarily have a chance to win is that you, you, you can focus your campaign in such a way that's going to get attention that aren't, isn't necessarily going to translate into votes. Uh, call from a 402 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Uh, this is Matt from Omaha. Matt from Omaha. What's on your mind? Folks, I got to tell oh, you, if you hold, uh, Matt, hold on one second. I got to tell you, if you're hanging on to the phone, there's like, we have 30 calls. We are about seven minutes away from, uh, from, from having to end the show. So, um, I don't want people to hang on, you know, continue to hang on, but Matt, you're on the line. What can I do for you? Um, I was calling in regards to, uh, the USMCA act. I think what Democrats are trying to do is they're trying to play the, centrist role of putting America first and being nonpartisan. Yep. And I think it's I I don't think it's the best idea. They don't understand that most people on the right are they're not gonna vote for you. They're not gonna do it. The Democrat agenda should be to rile up the left. Get these people motivated to go out and vote. That's why I like Bernie so much, because he is forgive the phrase, but he is just balls out left. That's a odd phrase, but um, but uh, I forgive you. I mean, I no, I agree, and I I struggle with the question as to is this really the strategy, or is it really um, basically the more palatable way of selling their agenda, which is um, which is just simply different. <laughs> you so know, hopefully that, it won't matter. Right. I mean, I think, you know, to a certain extent, you know, that's why I played that clip of, of, of me with Barbara Boxer. Like, you know, it was really more about Nancy Pelosi's power and it was more about getting something done. Uh, very often when you hear that, it what I think it is, is it is basically we were able to get what we wanted done. And uh, it's not necessarily what we wanted to get done was not necessarily an agenda that might be shared by a broad base of people. So we're just going to sell the fact that we got something done and that, you know, people like competency in general. There was a, there was a famous saying by um, Alfred Hitchcock about American audiences that he figured out. He said like, I could make the worst character in the world, like the most evil person, but if I show that they're competent at their job to an American audience in the first like two or three minutes, I can get away with anything. And um, I think there is some truth to that. However, the problem is, as you state, like the people who are going to vote or not vote for, you know, like, you know, going to base their decision to vote on the competency that is exhibited by getting this trade deal done is so marginal. Um and this is what I'm talking about, why I think the political trade-off is no good, because on the other hand, what you're doing is you're, you are stepping on your message that defeating Donald Trump is the most important thing that's, that, that's out there. And I understand that's a little bit, um, you know, black and white and a little uh, a manichaean, as they say. But um, uh, we had a guest the other day who quoted, um, 
was it Stevenson, Adelaide Stevenson, or somebody came up and said, you have got all of the, all of the smart thinking people's votes. And he says, well, that's great, but I need a majority. And, uh, and, and I think, you know, there's, I, I think I've heard you say that before. Well, I think it, it came up, uh, in, oh, in an show. interview the other day, but I appreciate the call, man. Good point. All right, folks. All right. <laughs> nope. That's it for our uh, phone call, um, portion of the program. Let me play one more clip. The, this is still extant. There was a story in the New York times last night by, um, Peter Baker, and was it Maggie Haberman, too? I'm not sure who it was. Um, Peter Baker. Let me just pull this thing out here. Oh, shoot. Um, and it, it's unclear at this point. The, the, the story was reporting that President Trump was planning to sign an executive order on Wednesday. That's today. Targeting what he sees as anti-Semitism on college campuses. Right. Um the order will effectively interpret Judaism as a race or nationality, not just a religion. Now, the order was released today. Well, here is uh, Blumenthal on uh, CNN responding to this. This is a senator from Connecticut. Today, the president's going to sign an executive order, which effectively makes Judaism a nationality in regards to students at college in, in protected college speech. What he's trying to do is crack down on anti-Semitism, some anti-Semitism uh, on college campuses. In, in doing that, the 1964 civil rights law, you basically have to say that Judaism is a nationality. There are some people who, who don't doubt the motivations here, but that's a precarious label in this case. It, the Soviet Union. Pause it did, for one second. I'm going to let him get on with that, why this is it. But there are some people who don't doubt the intent. Uh, excuse me? What? I got, I got news for you. There's a lot more who doubt his intent. There's some people who think the earth is flat. There's a lot more who think it's not flat. But continue. Don't doubt the motivations here, but that's a precarious label in this case. It, the Soviet Union did that for instance, uh, called Jews, Judaism and nation. It, it, it's a religion. What's the risk reward there? Is this something you support? I am very, very wary as a Jew of labeling Judaism as a nationality. It smacks not only of what happened in the Soviet Union, but also Nazi Germany, that my own father escaped in 1935. I'm an American. I am an American. My religion is Judaism, and my allegiance is to the United States of America. And I think there are other tools to fight discrimination. I've used them as a prosecutor and as a public official. There is no reason that we need to label Judaism as a nationality. I'm very wary of it. Okay, and um, uh, people are right to be nervous about that. It brings up the question of, like, dual lo loyalty and the intent is to criminalize things like uh, BDS, which they tried to do by statute, you'll recall. BDS is the uh, Boycott Divest... Um, uh, what is it? Sanction. Sanction uh, movement, wherein uh, people are trying to boycott, divest, and sanction uh, Israel for its occupation of... Uh, of Palestine and broadly speaking, what many Israeli leaders have described as an apartheid state, if not a fully formed one, certainly a developing one. Um, people can have uh, disagreements on whether, you know, what the intent of some core people associated with BDS is. I personally, uh, but for some of the academic uh, provisions um, tend to think it's a pretty good idea that, you know, is moving public opinion. I think the proof that it's moving some public opinion is the constant pushback and money spent to attack BDS and demonize it. Um, certainly in that context, the rights of Palestinians are um, 
underrepresented and uh, underdefended in this country around the world for the most part. Uh, but we had a situation where the secretary of education, Betsy DeVos, and she's got a guy working for him, Marcus. I think it's Ken Marcus, who has been, I think he is the assistant secretary of education for civil uh, liberties in the department of education. And they have been working on, uh, on stuff like this. Duke had some of its federal funding at the very least, uh, threatened because supposedly they had a program that was to uh, build cultural uh, awareness and language awareness, and they were being disrespectful of Israel or something to that effect. I think that's in still in court right now. Donald Trump the other day stood in front of a bunch of Jews and basically said, like, um, uh, every anti-Semitic trope you could drop in the world in front of these guys. Do you hate me, but you love me? Um, and to a certain extent, I think the timing of this has to do with trying to take some pressure off of his statements, which were highly anti-Semitic. The executive order was released today. From what I've read from lawyers from the Department of Justice, this executive order does not change existing law whatsoever. However, from a political perspective, what it does is it continues to chill the um, speech on campus. It continues to chill. And by speech on campus, I mean like literally like course selection <laughs> and federal funding. It is, um, it is basically a way, one more way, to attack any expression of rights for Palestinians is really what this is ultimately about. Not changing the law to say that criticism of Israel is inherently in prima facie anti-Semitic. It is creating this aura that criticism of Israel is on its face anti-Semitic. And this is not true. Some of the most vocal critics of Israel are Jews, Jews who uh, practice Judaism, Jews who do not practice Judaism, Jews who practice various forms of Judaism. But Jews, broadly speaking, are uh, also critical of Israel. Non-self-hating Jews, critical of Israel. I happen to be one of those. And under at least the regime and the spirit of what they're trying to do, if not the letter of the law of what they're trying to do, is to create this sense that criticism of Israel is inherently anti-Semitic. And this is a sop to the Christian Zionists, who support Donald Trump and the right wing Jews who support Donald Trump. This is basically just pay for play. Uh, so the reporting was out ahead of it, but we don't know if the language was changed after the reporting got out there and there was just everybody caught the hairs caught on fire. Another case of Trump derangement syndrome. But even if, the language was changed or this is part of the agenda to create this aura of where we're going. Really bad stuff. All right, folks, um, we're out of time. We didn't do any uh, IMs today. All the people were holding online. I appreciate it. But uh, sadly, there's only so many hours in the day. But we will be back tomorrow and the next day. Then after vac you know, vacation, which we call the weekend, we'll be back on Monday and then Tuesday and then Wednesday. You know how this goes. So uh, thank you for joining us and see you tomorrow. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want. But I know somehow I'm going to get there. I wasn't looking when I just got caught. 
the truth of the life.